Okay, welcome to the uh, Northampton City Council Committee on Legislative Matters for October 3rd, 2022, uh, 6.30 p.m. And um, I'll call this meeting to order. I'm Alex Jarrett, I'll be the chair. And um, Laura, could you call the roll, please? Sure. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Moulton. Here. And Councillor Nash. Here. Okay, we, um, so this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Um, and the first item on the agenda uh, is uh, public comment. And this is for items that aren't on the agenda. So when we get to each item in turn, um, we, there will be an opportunity to, to comment on those items. Uh, so uh, if you uh, wish to comment on something that is not on the agenda, uh, you could raise your hand now. And I just want to check with um, Nan S. Are you commenting on something that is that is not on the agenda? No, I'm looking for 31 um, Chapel Street. Sorry, I got my hand up too early. Okay, yeah, that, that's coming up shortly. Okay, so... Uh, we will move on to the approval of the minutes of the August 8th meeting. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? Uh, move move to second. And any discussion on those? Okay, seeing none, roll call please. Oh, you're muted, Laura. Who is the motion maker? I heard Stan is the second, but. Me. Marissa. Okay, thank you. Um, Process of, of, of elimination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. The minutes of August 8th uh, are approved unanimously. Next, we'll come to 22.158, an ordinance to amend the zoning map on Prince Street. Uh, the public hearing notice was published September 19th and September 26th in the Daily Hampshire Gazette per Mass General Law. This was referred to the planning board and legislative matters. Uh, the planning board gave it a positive recommendation. Um, so uh, could I have a motion to open the public hearing? Uh, move to open. Second. Any discussion on that? Roll call, please. Okay. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. So um, this is, while the public hearing is open, this is our opportunity to hear from the public and from city staff and to ask questions of city staff and then once we close the hearing, which we don't have to do today, but we can, uh, then we will deliberate on the recommendation. Um, so we'll first hear from proponents uh, of this item. And I believe that Carolyn Mish is here to speak from the planning department. Good evening, Council Members. Um, and everyone else. Um, so in front of you, and um, I don't, if Laura, could you put the map on the screen? Um, okay, thanks. So um, zoning amendment proposal that has been submitted to city council is, is what we refer to as a map amendment. So it's changing, um, physically changing the zoning classification for um, two parcels. And in this case, there are um, two parcels at the triangular intersection of where Prince Street, Chapel Street um, come in and sort of fork off from Prince Street coming out of downtown. And um, so it's um, those two parcels that are immediately uh, um, also surrounded by Planned Village. And the reason that this has been um, submitted and sponsored oh. Um, by the planning office and the uh, mayor's office is to allow for um, the reuse 
of these properties that were formerly for decades had um, an automobile um, repair and auto oriented uses on them. There are many um, non conforming aspects of the property. It's um, for the most part, all from the building where Metrix Auto um, building, former Metrix Auto was all the way to the corner is entirely paved. There are no um, defined sidewalks on either side. There's wide open curb cuts. The building is, um, is um, old and in, um, if anyone were to reuse it, it would take a significant <coughs> investment just in the building itself. And, um, as a commercial use, it's non-conforming in the current urban residential B um, uh, zoning district. So um, when you have a non-conforming use or commercial use of, such as this with so many um, non-conforming elements, um, there's sort of there are a couple of paths that can um, a property owner can take. One is to continue with a new similar use um, in the building and not make any changes to the property, and that wouldn't require any permitting, even with a new owner. Um, the other another path would be to reuse the property, um, but potentially for any other non-conforming use, and that would require a zoning board permit, but it wouldn't necessarily require. Um, full compliance with the urban residential B, um, open space, setbacks, parking locations, curb cuts, um, trees, and other landscaping. Um, or um, an applicant could apply to bring the entire property into compliance, you know, taking out all the impervious surface, rebuilding the building, meeting the setbacks. Um, and if you were to do that, in that case, on this property, it would take a tremendous amount of um, financial investment to do that. And um, the total footprint or the usable area of the lot would be um, would shrink. Um, and so um, this the the reason for the rezoning that's in front of you to a planned village actually allows more flexibility with the total build out that could be allowed on the property and also a little more flexibility with the setbacks. Um, and so we think that it's appropriate to think about the rezoning because of the context that it's surrounded by planned village and that it would allow this property to actually come into compliance, eliminate the non-conforming aspects and the, and the aspects of the property that really aren't consistent with residential uses or the planned village um, in its um, entirety either. It also, by rezoning to planned village, brings in a whole set of design criteria that's not um, a part of the urban residential B zoning um, district or any other district because planned villages was uniquely created um, and the special permit granted for that was created with a whole um, notebook of design guidelines for various uses. It also allows um, mixed uses, meaning it doesn't have to be entirely residential. Um, but it is a very small parcel. So the likelihood of um, any sort of um, larger commercial um, development is, is pretty small in terms of, sort of industrial uses or um, other kind of larger commercial uses. And so that's sort of the, that's the background and the reason why the zoning is put in front of the um, City Council for consideration. It did go to the planning board. The planning board re uh, recommended um, to move forward um, with the zoning change. I will say that conversation, as you all probably have heard, also um, included a discussion about thinking more in a big picture way of um, rezoning that whole triangle um, to plan village because it is completely surrounded sort of on the other chapel other side of the street, um, north and south. Um, that wouldn't make a change to any of the existing uses on the pro property, but that certainly isn't part of your consideration um, now. It was a conversation the planning board had, knowing full well that, of course, that would take another um, round of public um, engagement um, before even leading into any kind of um, city council um, proposal or proposed amendment. Great, Question? thank you, Jeff. Um, 
so we'll first take questions from counselors uh, and then hear from other proponents and then hear from uh, opponents or others who wish to speak and then we'll uh, have Carolyn respond again to those questions to any questions that are raised during that time. Um, so other counselors uh, on the committee, any questions for Carolyn? Stan. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn, is there a potential new use for this property that we're aware of? Um, the, um, the property has been sold and the new um, owner is interested in building residential and a small office space. But um, um, at the at the very point of the um, intersection there, but no plans have been submitted that would require planning board approval. It would require a special permit amendment of the planned village in addition to site plan for the actual development proposal. And at that point, the planning board would evaluate all the um, aspects of the proposed project. Thanks. Jim. Thank you. So, um, hello, Carolyn. Um, so, the um, so with this proposed change, how does it affect the setbacks between this property and the abutting uh, properties that are outside the zone? It, um, right or. So currently, under urban residential B, there's a 15 foot side setback. Right. Um, Tip, there aren't any minimum setbacks for projects within the planned village. It's whatever the applicant proposes to the planning board, but the planning board has the jurisdiction to evaluate um, the way the property is um, laid out and designed. And um, so from that context, you could say there's no um, setback against the um, urban residential B zone, except that it really, it's a case by case basis. So the, um, there, it may be appropriate to have landscaping or other kind of um, separation or demarcation between um, the lot lines. If you, I mean, if you look at the state hospital now, there are setbacks for every property. So even though there were zero setbacks required, um, every lot um, up that's been built out at the state hospital has um, a separation between the buildings and their um, corresponding lot boundaries. There may be a few places where it bumps up against a driveway here and there, but um, generally the pattern has been that there have been um, um, setbacks and there are standard landscape requirements for all the parcels um, and building orientation, building design, building materials kind of thing in the design standards. The other thing I will say is there is a property that's also been part of this, per this acquisition by the property owner. It is not part of the rezoning request. So that property um, is farther towards um, Laurel Street and that will remain urban residential B. Um, and the, the, uh, the current owner um, actually um, asked not to have that piece brought into the planned village. And so that's the, the owner is one of the abutters. So we're talking, there's two yep. properties within the triangle. There's a rectangle and then a triangle. And then one of the abutting properties is owned by the current property mm -hmm. owner under question. Okay. Yes. And, um, and so I, um, so how might this play? So it sounds like there, I, I'd have to look at the map again to see how many other properties would be impacted. Um, here, let me just pull this up. Uh, maps are always good. Where'd you go map? D -d -d. Um, it's loading. Want me to share it? I need, I pulled up the right, yeah, share it, please. I, I pulled right. up the parking map. <laughs> Let's go to the next topic. Yeah, so uh, the owner owns which of those two abutting properties, the, the top one or the bottom one? So 13, 38, 13, 38A, 13. 38, um, 13, so the bottom one. Yeah, yeah. okay. 
All right. And so that in terms of if a project happens there, um, so they wouldn't get the 15 foot setback protection. So, but the, you're saying that the planned village would require, has a way of managing setbacks. Right. And so there wouldn't be, I, is there a guarantee that there wouldn't be a building right on the property line? With plan um, there's not um there's not a guarantee that there wouldn't be a building on the lot line right i will say and i don't know this and i i don't want to pretend that i know but i but i understand that the building code has some restrictions and provisions in it that really um, that come into play when you put a building on a lot line. Mm -hmm. And there it relates to fire suppression fire code that many <laughs> times is enough of a disincentive that people don't want to put their buildings on the lot line. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all I'll say about that because I don't know enough of the building code to know those details, but mm -hmm. I um, know that that's a factor when people are sort of thinking about citing their the properties, um, their developments. Um, and I will say that it also is more complicated if you want to do maintenance, right, on the side of the building, mm -hmm. unless you've gotten an easement to go on somebody else's property, it becomes, I mean, you really, most of the time that you're going to see a building on a lot line is going to be in the context of downtown, downtown Northampton, downtown Florence, where historically the buildings were built right next to each other and um, not in a situation where you've got a little bit more room, you're building something new and you want ultimately to be able to maintain um, that the side of the building. The one thing that does come into play with that when a building is on the lot line are the windows. And so either you can't have any windows and you have to have a firewall or you have to have some special windows. And then that affects obviously the lighting that you're bringing into the building. So um, when you have a building right up on the lot line and you're, and let's say it's a residential building, you're gonna wanna have as many as windows as possible surrounding that building to bring the light into the building to make it a nice livable space. And so that's going to, um, um, that's part of the calculus um, for, how to site a building on the property. Well, I, it's probably safe to say in the end that it whatever goes in there will look better than what's there right now, correct? That's the hope <laughs> and the, that's, the de, that's the desired outcome. I mean, that's why we're doing this zoning change is to say, look, let's give you a little bit of an incentive to really invest and make this property fit in you know, to the context, like complete asphalt, unsafe pedestrian, um, you know, crossings, uh, parking cars all the way to the edges is not um, um, the kind of um, design characteristic that I think that we would um, say we want to continue in that location, but it's very hard to, you know, it's very hard to move against that. <laughs> 40, 50 years of the same. Um, and so this could, this will help um, bring that property um, back to the standards that the city holds now for um, new development. So I guess that whatever would go in there under this new, under planned village would obviously look better than what's currently there and also would adhere to standards that are throughout planned village that it it looks pretty good up there all of the properties and those same sensibilities would be brought to bear in this case yes i see you nodding all right thank you yes <laughs> thank you um and that so what are the chances? So it would make it less likely that we would get another, uh, like a gas station there, right? Right. So um, one could apply for a gas station. Um, or a convenience store. Go to the zoning store. board. Yep. Right. For a convenience store. I mean, to be clear, we would um, 
um, discourage that and, and encourage um, alternative uses because of the safety impacts, because of the, um, uh, because of where that parcel is located on the street, you know, we'd say you have to close up your curb cuts, but it's still a permit process that's um, available through the zoning board to uh, modify the use to another non-conforming use. Okay, and um, is it is it appropriate to discuss here the the planning board's big picture discussion? I because um, this is a hearing on this, but that was I, I know that it raised a concern for folks. Um, sure. I mean, okay. I'll leave it up to you. It's your committee, but I don't think well, I, I'm also I mean, looking to the chair for for guidance here because um, it. It, I yeah. If yeah, if you have questions about what the planning board discussed, uh, but okay. I wouldn't want us to stray into deliberation until we've closed the hearing. Thank you, thank you. That's exactly. So, in terms of this big picture discussion, you know, in terms of setting the boundary, like here's why this is why we're putting the line here. It it does make sense to me for the planning board to say, oh yeah, why did you put the line there? And why didn't you put it over here? And okay. and and so the, you know, while it's it's not on the agenda um, to discuss where moving the line, but discussion of why you put the line there make, makes a lot of sense. And so is that that was the nature of the discussion? That's exactly right. They want yeah, they had questions about why it was drawn the way it was. Why didn't did anybody consider it a different line? Um, right. What does that make sense to have a different line? But in the you know, but what's on the table in front of them was what was on the table, and that's all they can recommend um, right. for that piece. And then they made you know side comments about well, maybe we should think about this in the future um, instead of just taking a tiny bite of that um, portion of the property. Okay. Thank you. I, I think I think I'm good for now. Thank you, Carolyn, and um, thank you, Alec. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up a little on um, what Jim was asking about in terms of that in the Plan Village District, the Planning Board has a lot more um, ability to say yes or no, or than in a regular, you know, here's a site plan in in, a, in another district. That the planning board guides this process a lot more. Is that is that correct? Can you speak to that? Sure. Yeah. The way that the planned village um, was established here was to say, okay, we're going to create this special permit. And this is why I say there's a special permit amendment because this property wasn't originally part of the original of uh, the special permit boundaries that were created. So um, the district was established. Um, the, I'm sorry, the special permit was granted for a portion of the area. And um, then within that, um, there were sort of a series of, um, of parameters established for what all, all the projects that would be pre um, presented subsequent to that special permit adoption, knowing that it would take a long time to build out the state hospital. And so each time now a project comes in, the planning board evaluates the new application against the provisions within the um, special permit and the design criteria. Um, and so that is a different um, tool and, and mechanism for review than in the other districts in the city. Great, thank you. Um, okay, any other counselors on this committee? Stan. Uh, yes, thank you. Following up on Jim's uh, questions about the aesthetics of this particular piece of property, Carolyn, you mentioned that Plan Village will bring a whole new set of design criteria into play that isn't uh, uh, available in the URB district. Can you give an example or two of how that might affect a mixed residential office uh, development? Sure. Well, um, building materials are a big component of the design guidelines, which aren't allowed in this sort of the gener general zoning. Um, 
So um, there are also requirements about um, more requirements about um, orientation and sort of um, even for residential buildings, any structure that's along the street has to. The idea is you'd want to you want to build buildings, especially on a street like this. You want the buildings up to the street as opposed to set um, further back. Um, so that's another reason why there are no um, setbacks. Because, for example, if you did a small commercial building, you'd want it to frame the street and you want it up at the street side and. In the URB district, there's a um, 10 foot setback. Um, and so if you're trying to create this character, more of a village center character, you'd want the buildings up close to the street. Um, but so there's uh, the building sort of relationships to each other. Um, there is a component that was raised, you know, both at the um, neighborhood meeting that we had before the zoning was introduced, as well as during the planning board um, public hearing about parking. There's no minimum parking required at the planned village. Again, it's sort of at the discretion that the applicant comes forward and says to the planning board, here's why I'm only showing five parking spaces or here's why I'm showing 10. Um, and there's a maximum of two parking spaces um, that can be provided for any one residential unit, for example. So that's a little bit different than in the residential districts. Um, However, we also in downtown in the highway business district and the industrial district, we don't have minimum parking requirements there either. But the idea really is that the applicant proposes what makes sense um, in terms of market, their market, um, financing comes into it. So the, um, the idea is that the zoning shouldn't predetermine how many parking spaces if the applicant doesn't need that many parking spaces. Um, that doesn't mean that for no parking will be provided. It just means that there's not, um, you know, a rigid sort of um, minimum that's required. Thanks. Okay. Um, so are there other proponents? I know uh, Councillor Karen Foster is one of the sponsors of this. Um, uh, and yeah, I'll go to you, Karen. Thanks, Alex. Um, I've got used to using first names here, so thank you. Um, I do want to share some thoughts um, about this order specifically and sort of um, the larger process as well. Um, first, I want to start with just incredible gratitude to Director Mish uh, for her thoughtful outreach and engagement, um, both with me as a ward counselor and neighborhood residents with questions and concerns. Um, Director Mish actually reached out to me first um, back in June to discuss this, um, to kind of take the temperature and, and get a sense of, of what I thought. And honestly, at that time, I, I really wasn't sure. Um, so we held a um, on-site neighborhood engagement meeting um, back on July 5th, and that included um, <laughs> residents of Village Hill, as well as the um, neighborhood to the south, the Chapel, Earl, Laurel, Grove, and Rustav neighborhood, um, maybe 30-ish people there to discuss that. Um, you know, and, and from there, um, Director Mish has answered emails, phone calls um, to explain the intricacies of Plan Village and urban residential zoning. Many of those emails and phone calls have come from me um, as well. And um, just last week, in response to a great deal of neighborhood confusion and some misinformation, um, she generously agreed to another neighborhood meeting to further engage um, with questions. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for that time and, and effort spent to really drill down on, on what this proposal means. Um, you know, with that said, I am in support of a zoning change at this property location. Um, you know, when Carolyn first approached me in June, I really wasn't sure. And I spent um, quite a bit of time thinking about it, learning more and understanding what a change to plan village zoning in that location would mean. Um, it was really important to me that any zoning change would be good for um, the neighborhood and not for a specific developer. And um, you know, through the information that I have access to, I believe this change meets that standard. Um, the property currently is a non-conforming use that would be tremendously difficult to develop to a conforming urban residential B standards. It's a cornerstone of the neighborhood. It's, it's right there. And a, a lot of people in the neighborhood um, brought their cars to Metrics and Metrics was kind of a beloved auto repair shop. Um, but now that Metrics is no longer being used, 
it, it's a paved over eyesore um, for the neighborhood. Um, you know, it's a reality we're dealing with all over Northampton that the cost of land, building materials, labor, fuel, supply chain challenges mean housing is expensive and it's unrealistic um, that that lot would be redeveloped um, anytime soon in a way that, that conforms well with current zoning um, and that can improve um, that corner of the neighborhood. Um, and I do want to address a kind of a little bit of a background um, while I'm speaking. You know, this, this neighborhood has seen a tremendous amount of change um, in about the last 20 years, as even more than that at this point, um, as a result of the redevelopment of the former state hospital. Um, and many of those plans that were put in place back in the 90s are just now coming to fruition. To fruition. So it feels like a lot of, that, that the neighborhood has seen quite a bit of change. Um, you know, the neighborhood has seen um, Cole Morgan, which is now L3 move in, and that was not, you know, expected um, according to the original master plan for redevelopment of the state hospital. And that was disappointing. Um, so that was one and we understand plans change, but, but that was significant. Um, the planned village zoning on Laurel Street made way for um, four new houses to be built some years back. Um, and the houses that were built were unfortunately built without an adequate stormwater management plan. Um, and so that's something that, that um, some folks on Laurel Street uh, are still dealing with. And, um, you know, also on Laurel Street, um, as part of this plan build zoning, um, we have a, a very much needed um, 20 unit affordable housing complex coming. And hopefully another one um, is in the works for just around the corner on Chapel Street. So these are some really significant changes um, that the neighborhood is seeing. Um, and, you know, there, there really was quite a bit of concern raised based on that planning board discussion on September 8th, um, where it was suggested that the surrounding places that make up the triangle of land between Laurel Chapel and Prince Streets be rezoned to Planned Village. And I understand from a quick read of the map why, you know, the, the boundaries of what's being considered here tonight and um, why that was questioned and why um, the planning board wanted to dig into a deeper conversation. Um, but really the, the Planned Village zoning was created to support uh, intentional redevelopment of the former state hospital. And it, it really was applied to land that was going to be repurposed. Um, the lot under discussion tonight um, is kind of an outlier. It was not part of that original redevelopment. And yet to me, a planned village zoning change makes a lot of sense there because it's really unrealistic um, that it would be developed um, under the current zoning rules. Um, it would require a variance, uh, most likely at a non-conforming use and, and the reason we have zoning co codes and changes is so that we all know what to expect. And so development and, and land use and neighbors moving in, it's not at the whims of those currently living in the neighborhood. Um, zoning codes that are clear and allow for um, everyone to understand what to know actually supports healthy growth in our neighborhoods. Um, and just to be sure though, that my remarks are clear, both to you, the Committee on Legislative Matters, as, as well as I, I know there's a number of residents here listening, um, my full support, my name's on the order to rezoning 31 Prince Street from urban residential B to planned village. Um, I do believe that is a positive change for the neighborhood and I look forward to the possibilities of redevelopment there. Um, and I encourage a positive recommendation on this proposal for consideration for the full city council. However, I do want to be clear that my support for rezoning this parcel of land does not extend to the other nearby um, properties and does not extend to that full triangle. So I, I do want to be clear though, even though we're only talking about the one parcel of land, I want to be clear on, on where my support is. Um, it, it, so that that's, that's important to me that that be clear. And I really appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you, Karen. Uh, other proponents of this uh, legislation, I see several hands, and um, so Nan, are you, are you speaking in, in favor of this legislation? No. Okay, Harriet? I am still have a number of questions that would clarify things for me okay. and and yeah you would you will definitely get a chance to speak um shortly all right um, that's just, fine thank we, you we have this order in which we we hear from proponents first and then we hear from opponents and 
uh, anyone else who wishes to speak. So it's, it's a little clunky, but we'll get there. Um, and Barbara? And, and I'm not a proponent. Okay. Um, so if there are no other proponents who wish to speak, then we will go to, gener to uh, opponents or just those who wish to speak uh, in, in any capacity. So we'll start with Nan S. Hi. I attended the September 8th planning board hearing on the 31 chapter. Um, and I'm sorry, Nan, could you state your full name and oh, your sorry. Ad address? Uh, in a public hearing, we do want to hear where people live. Yes, yeah, sorry, I missed that. Uh, Nancy Smith, 48 Chapel Street. I attended the September 8th planning board hearing on the 31 Chapel Street rezone to PV to express concerns about its limited restrictions like zero parking spaces and the lack of permitting requirements for builders. In PV, the site plan is, uh, is approved by only the planning director and the planning board. If they have no issues, builders are pretty much good to go. Today in URB, if your neighbor sells their homes, you expect a new neighbor. A teardown permit would take a year. In PV, that house could come right down as no teardown permit is required. If you don't have a, someone camped at a planning board meetings, you could have no idea what's coming next. 10 unit mini condo development with zero parking or a marijuana processing facility, which even with filtering requirements listed in PV, the smell from these facilities can be stomach turning. This zone change is about a lot more than just greater flexibility for builders. It is a tool for increasing builder profit and for tearing down and gentrifying working and middle class neighborhoods piece by piece and block by block. What I say next may seem off topic, but what I learned going through the approval process for this 31 Chapel Street rezone is directly related to the issues I have with the rezone and fully back my argument against it. Well, before I got to speak at that planning board meeting, the board decided it should expand the rezone to PV, to PV for the entire metrics block, which includes a four family rental, two single family homes and a church. After I spoke, the board then approved only 31 Chapel Street's rezone for referral here with just a recommendation to expand it to the block. A single family home on that block is already being gutted what, for what could be a quick permitless takedown. Offers are being made on other tree parcels there as well. The blocks rezone may not be on tonight's agenda, but it's likely coming soon if this passes. Many in our neighborhood received offers on our homes nearly two years ago, stating the city's plans for us will make our homes worthless if we stay. The proposed kennel came quickly after, so we know we're a target. If neighbors sell their home in PV, that marijuana processing plant could move right in next door. The stench from these facilities has been called nauseating by those just living near one. What a great way to destroy and clear a targeted neighborhood. PV could soon be used on redevelopment projects in other targeted neighborhoods as well, and PV zoning creep is sure to happen. Please, let's stop this now. PV zoning is not needed to get this project done. The neighborhood is not against the apartments, just the zone change. At a neighborhood meeting held during the July 4th holiday week, many neighbors who attended now feel they were not given the information they needed to fully grasp the implications of PV zoning creeping into our residential neighborhood. While they felt the possible small apartments could be good, they did not realize that with a PV rezone, the builder could put a lot more than just apartments there, especially if he planned to buy and build a larger section of that block, but couldn't. Creeping PV zoning down the road into existing middle and working class neighborhoods lends itself to nothing but gentrification and corruption down that road. If only a small apartment building is needed, why can't the city use a smart growth overlay of variances to get the work done? PV zoning allows far greater density, zero parking, and much more. All this means far greater profit for builders painting a big red bullseye on our homes and neighborhoods. We are a middle and working class neighborhood containing shelters with affordable housing units welcomed and on their way. Many of our homes are naturally, occur occur sorry, naturally occurring affordable homes and rentals as neighborhoods like ours are where middle and lower income people live. I understand the city wants to generate more tax dollars, but drawing profit targets on the backs of neighborhoods like ours so we can be replaced by high-end condos, luxury homes, or loud toxic businesses meant to drive us out only exacerbates the housing crisis. It doesn't help it. 
that affordable for family behind metrics could become a gold mine for builders to knock down, replace with 20 potentially parkingless high end condos or rentals, driving rents and home prices even higher if we allow PV zoning to creep in. It could also potentially put four more families on the street. Let's stop this before it starts. We as a neighborhood have proved our willingness to work with the city and developers with our collaboration on the 23 Laurel Street Affordable Housing Project. We want to work with the city on, and developer on this greater than standard density apartment complex, but we want to protect our homes and neighborhoods too. There could be a win-win here. I contend that PV zoning was created to redevelop on the property where state hospital buildings once stood. It was a rare project. It was never intended to gentrify or tear down existing residential neighborhoods piece by piece or block by block. And every time we move it a block, it threatens the next block. This should never be allowed to happen, especially at a time like this. We already have people in Florence packing up to move from rentals they call home for a decade or more. Gentrification is real in Northampton. The reasons may not all be the same, but we cannot afford to make unnecessary zoning changes like this that put our homes, neighborhoods, and people in danger. I am asking the planning director and city council to reject the 31 Trapple Street rezone to PV in lieu of staying URB and using a smart growth overlay or variances to allow the apartment project to move forward while allowing us to protect our homes and neighborhoods. And I just want to say our neighborhood has been through a lot in the last few years, but we have a new mayor this year, some new city council members, and more recently, very recently, a new planning director. Many of the plans I have seen are a decade or two old now and no longer fit the world we live in. I know change does not happen overnight, but I am hopeful we can, change, we can find new ways to work together to help our city grow while protecting our neighborhoods, homes, people, and tree cover. Rejecting the 31 Chapel Street rezone to Plan Village seems like a great place to start. And for this committee, I believe I am asking really for a negative recommendation on 31 Chapel's uh, rezone to City Council. We can nip this in the bud this week. No matter how well intentioned, there are serious negative impacts from zoning changes like this. Thank you for all you do and for listening to my long-winded speech, but I think it's important not, not just to my neighborhood, but to neighborhoods throughout the city who have had other zoning ordinances passed and they're really causing issues for them. So uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Nan. Um, next, we have Harriet Diamond. If you could state your name and your residence. Uh, I'm, my name is Harriet Diamond, and I live at 141 Grove Street. And I, I just have a, a, it seems to me that with Planned Village, if you were living in that spot on one of those houses, like Marie Frank's house, which is right next to the little church, even though, you know, you say it's an eyesore, but it's an eyesore that we know what it is. And if, if you were to ask me, what's a safer thing for me, if I was a neighbor of that, I would say, I don't know what can come with Planned Village. How many stories can something be? What if they don't have enough parking spaces? What if it is a gas station? All of a sudden, a rundown asphalt lot doesn't seem so bad in comparison uh, to something that would shade my whole property or people would be parking all over the place or looking for parking or running in and out of a convenience store. It would just change the nature. So I think it's really incumbent on um, the planning board, um, this legislative council to look at what people in this neighborhood have ch had with URB um, and assure them that they're actually going to get something that does fit in and that 
or why would they not be for URB, which at least, you know, yes, you'd need a bunch of variances and maybe the road cuts aren't okay, but you have a certain understanding that, um, you know, there's the 60-40 rule, which is 40% of the property can be built on, 60 must be um, uh, permeable, basically. Well, these things are incredibly important to a neighborhood in terms of how much water's running on the street, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems to me that to not to give any assurances and to go to planned village, this is what is so frightening. And, and also it seems like neighborhoods have seen planned village not work. So I just want to say that, you know, I would like to see something that does conform with both the neighborhood's desires and the desires of the city to repurpose this and make it better. But there just aren't enough assurances with the planned village zoning to, and, and I really think it is incumbent on the city to recognize that the planned village doesn't really give very much of an opportunity for the neighborhood to have any control in the planning process other than complaining after the fact. And it, um, it, it doesn't really give the planning board as many options because because they're just sitting there and they, they, they can't even discourage certain uses of the property. That's actually not allowed in PV. So I just wanted to point out why there are so many reservations against planned village and wonder if there's another way to go about this. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, next is Barbara Blumenthal. Okay, yes, Barbara Blumenthal, 39 Chapel Street. And first of all, I just, I'm confused about a point and I'm, I don't know whether uh, Carolyn Mish can help me with this because at the August 25th planning board meeting, Laura Baker of Valley CDC presented plans for the 20 units at 23 Laurel Street. And she said, and it's actually written on one of her slides, that 23 Laurel Street is an SG overlay within URB zoning. However, on a more recent map that Carolyn presented during a, um, it was a both in meeting and Zoom meeting at City Hall, and I'm sorry, it was either on September 28th or 29th, I think, it shows all of the odd side of Laurel Street to be in PV zoning, except for 37 and 39, which are houses on the corner of Laurel and Chapel. And I am wondering when that zoning was changed and was there really adequate discussion and deliberation? I know of other neighbors who didn't realize this had happened um, or were just confused about when it happened. And I'm wondering if any neighbors were notified because zoning changes, you know, they, they can obviously be significant. And I think all Northampton residents deserve proper notification and input. So, and can I do the rest of my comments and then maybe Carolyn can answer that first question? Um, yeah, so we'll take comments, and once we've taken yeah, okay. all the comments, okay. then we'll go back right. and um, at, have uh, okay. folks answer questions. Right. So, Karen, also, do you feel like you, you've got that question? Yeah, yeah, that question. But now I want to say something about tonight's um, topic, 31 Chapel Street. And I apologize, okay. yes. there may be a, there may be a little bit of, of repetition, but I really want my voice heard in my own words, and I really will be brief. So... URB zoning is defined as primarily residential with single to three family units allowed in different development patterns, including townhouse units. New homes should consist of units that maintain orientation, rhythm, setback pattern, and street frontage green patterns of the surrounding block face. Now, as we all know, planned village zoning is not URB. Um, I did not object to planned village zoning for the redevelopment of the Northampton State Hospital. It seemed logical, and although I may never get over the fact that nearly all of the original state hospital buildings were demolished, PV zoning seemed appropriate for starting with a clean slate. 
but that's not the case on the southern side of Chapel Street, except for Cole Morgan, sorry, L3, it's always going to be Cole Morgan, which is on land that was part of the hospital. But it was also quite appropriate that the PV zoning for the hospital redevelopment did a jog around the triangle that contains 31, 33, 37, and 37 and a half Chapel Street. The chapel's number is 37 and a half and a multifamily house and barn on Prince Street. And the Plan Valley, Plan Village zoning did not include 37 and 39 Laurel Street because they also were not part of the former state hospital's land. That triangle and the two houses I've mentioned on Laurel Street are part of a long established residential neighborhood, which is rightly zoned URB. And I strongly object to Plan Village zoning creeping into existing built up residential neighborhoods. I know that this meeting is only addressing the two parcels at 31 Chapel Street, but I object to these parcels changing to Plan Village because it's just too close to abutters and other neighbors, and it could greatly alter the character of the neighborhood. And it might just be an invitation for more unwanted zoning changes on Hospital Hill. And thank you for listening to all of our comments. Thank you, Barbara. And I'm sorry, did you state your uh, address? Yeah, 39 Chapel Street. Great. Right, right, right next to the chapel. And <laughs> because they're 37 and a half, there's always been confusion. Thank you. Uh, Claudia Lefko. Hello, Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. I'm not in the neighborhood and I'm just listening to the discussion. And I honestly, sorry that I'm new to this, but I don't get what's to be gained by this. And all these concerns about what it looks like there, I'm familiar with the neighborhood because I'm a regular protester at L3 Harris, which happens to be the sixth largest you know, uh, military contractor in the world. The facility is an abomination in the neighborhood with a huge parking lot and then the building there. So this, you know, when people keep saying, you know, the neighborhood is little and blah, 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 but nobody's talking about L3, which takes up that whole corner there, unfortunately. So I guess I don't understand what's to be gained and why there's even, honestly, I get the people who might live, you know, behind the metrics uh, uh, auto repair, obviously they care, but in terms of people going by on the street, when you have L3 there, the, the little the asphalt seems to fit right in. So I'm just, my question is what's to be gained, you know, there um, and based on sort of what, given that you have this huge facility there, this military contractor. So that's my comment. Thank you, Claudia. Um, so if there aren't any other, uh, Rick Colson. So turn off mute here. Let's oh, sorry, Rick. You you weren't. You're you're now muted. And okay. yeah, please state your uh, thank you your, yes. your name and address. Yeah, Rick Colson, fifteen Laurel Street. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Nan for her very eloquent um, uh, presentation of her viewpoint. Um, uh, far more eloquent than I usually tend to be. Um, and I want to thank Karen for bringing up some of the uh, background regarding the surrounding areas. I happen to live in one of the houses on Laurel Street that's uh, suffering from uh, basement flooding that uh, she had re referred to. Um, so I, so I basically agree with uh, everything that Nan said, um, and uh, but wanted to bring up a couple of additional points that relate largely to uh, the other projects that are going on in the area or will be going on. And not that I want to discuss those in any detail. It's not my purpose. I understand that the purpose of this meeting today is to discuss uh, the uh, triangular lot specifically that we're talking about. But, but those decisions will be impacted. Uh, certainly, the, the, what happens there will be impacted by the other projects that are being looked at in the neighborhood. And right now, there's a project uh, being looked at for um, uh, 23 Laurel uh, that, uh, as it stands, does not have specified sufficient parking. Now, there's some disagreement about that, in my opinion, and uh, from what I can gather, and based on the averages of number of parking spaces per unit for similar facilities in the area, based on research that we've done, 
uh, the proposed development on 23 does not have sufficient parking. Um, a very short distance away, just on the other side of Rust Avenue now, there is likely to be um, another project. We have no idea what the parking is going to be there. We have no idea the number of units that's going to be there, but it's being talked about as a similar kind of development or at least similar purposes. And this lack of parking is going to cause, already going to cause, significant traffic issues on Laurel Street. Um, it, 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 there will be spillover. There are uh, not enough parking units for the people who are going to be living there, let alone uh, visitors. This is a very highly trafficked street, Laurel, because people use it as a cut through from Route 10 to Route 66 all the time. I have reported to the police department on at least three or four different occasions, excessive rates of speed, dramatically excessive rates of speed uh, going up Laurel Street and going through the intersection uh, at the head of Laurel Street, where it crosses uh, Prince, where the, the project that we're talking about is. Uh, already some significantly unsafe conditions and nothing being done about it. Uh, and that's only going to get worse as there is spillover on the street, cars parked on the street, children going out to cars on the street, um, and much greater density, essentially the density on Laurel Street. And I don't know if people understand or appreciate this, but the density on Laurel Street is going to triple from its present state upon the completion of the uh, low-income housing there. So uh, much more traffic, many more people, much bigger uh, safety uh, issues involved. And uh, the allowance for uh, no parking under PV um, is uh, just going to uh, create additional difficulties. In fact, I wonder how many people are going to park around the corner on Laurel Street because it's off the main road and it's easy to get to and there's parking on the street. Um, I don't know what we're going to do to prevent that. There's already going to be spillover from the proposed uh, development. Um, and uh, my uh, neighbor across the street has had a car hit. Uh, we've had a car hit uh, in front of our house. Um, and uh, luckily, no one hurt. Uh, but... <laughs> There, but the grace, and um, these uh, become increasing possibilities as we uh, increase the density of traffic and parking uh, in the immediate um, neighborhood. Um, my second point, and I'll be very brief with this one, is that the idea of allowing uh, and creating zoning in a neighborhood like ours that allows for the development of virtually any kind of uh, habitation, commercial, manufacturing, um, uh, military, uh, um, uh, residential, um, the allowance of zoning that's open enough to create all of those opportunities um, uh, is, is obscene. And um, uh, the, the uh, oftentimes the comments that are made in support of that are things like, um, the likelihood will be that it will be residential, largely residential, because residents, uh, residential development is what's needed right now. Well, we know that things are cyclical and housing might be needed right now, but in five years, uh, housing may not be needed. Maybe uh, more commercial opportunities will be needed. We just don't know. And I don't find um, expressions or uh, 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 words like likelihood to be particularly reassuring. Um, you know, the discussion about um, uh, win windows on the back of a property, uh, let's just say it is uh, uh, a commercial property. Well, let's not just say it's a commercial property. We don't know what it's going to be. That's exactly the point under PV zoning is that any use is allowed. And clearly, um, it became evident in uh, discussions in a, a meeting with uh, uh, Carolyn the other day, and uh, Carolyn, thank you for, for hosting that meeting and for giving us an opportunity to, to speak a little bit, um, uh, that many of the people who attended the on-site meeting uh, at uh, 31 did not understand what PV meant exactly. Um, several people made that comment in the meeting, and um, you know, it, 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 um, it, and that's being, and their support is being used as evidence for supporting this project when they clearly didn't understand what they were supporting. So, um, uh, you know, 
I'm not calling for a negative vote on this or a positive vote on this. I don't know, but it seems to me that there must be a better way of addressing some of these issues than creating a situation in which in future, there is absolutely no control over what goes on that lot. That's not an eventuality that I'm prepared to live with. Uh, I live in this neighborhood. I'd like some degree of certainty that what happens in this neighborhood is appropriate to the character of the neighborhood and appropriate to beneficial uses rather than uh, destructive uses. We have no guarantee of any of that. Just well intent, but no guarantee. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Diane Scott is next. Diane, if you could uh, state your present uh, place of residence. Hi, I have a hard time blink talking to a blank screen. Um, I live at um, over my hand. I live at 44 Landy Avenue, which is across from the famous 39 Landy Avenue property. Um, I, I, a couple things. One is I take umbrage with the term eyesore because we had the same thing where, yeah, the house in its state was an eyesore, but um, that became one of the arguments for, um, I believe, fast tracking a, a developer, it, getting into that property and doing things that have sort of been nightmarish. But um, I don't support any rezoning that would allow any development going forward that does not have a proposal in place and approved before, before there's any, like I say, get the proposal and then change the zoning if you have to do it. Don't change the zoning and then allow things that you can't, you can't go back on, you know, once it's up, once the building is too high, once the building takes up too much space and doesn't allow for enough permeation, once the, um, the ratio of uh, green space to building space is done, um, that's too late. It's too late and then you risk being sued by the developer. And that brings you to the point that if the land is sold to a developer, then they own it and they are afforded the same rights sometimes more than homeowners have. And um, I don't believe that that should be the policy. And I know that there's some things in the infill provision that allow for that. And so I guess that said, that means that I hate the infill provision thing. And I think that it needs to be revisited and readdressed before more things happen that we can't, we can't fix. The tree thing here is still um, really raw and really awful and really ugly. And so I support no, um, no changing of zoning things until you know what's going to be put there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Deborah Berkovitz. Uh, my video, hold on, sorry. I'm here and I my video seems to not be working. Um, we can hear you. And if you could uh, okay. state your street address. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, I, I <clears throat> am on a work computer and I seem to have my, my computer not working, my camera not working. Uh, my name is Deborah Berkovitz. I live at 41 Warner Street. I also uh, uh, am an owner of a property abutting the, uh, the infamous 39 Landy project. And, <clears throat> you know, I didn't, I, I don't actually have a huge feeling about this particular project. It's more about my experience in the last few years of watching the planning processes and the zoning changes. And what I have seen is that there has been a push, 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 especially on the part of our planning director um, to uh, basically as a precedent set, there's a next boundary that's moved along. And so I think that people in this neighborhood are, who are concerned about where this might lead to have very good reason to be concerned that the next time that when this comes up, it's, oh, we've already rezoned this triangle, these couple parcels. So it makes sense to do it at the next one, because that has been my experience so far with the variety of zoning changes that have allowed for increasing densification, even in the face of tremendous resident opposition, um, even a member of the planning, you know, the previous member of the planning board, uh, who was very concerned about what was happening and felt uh, completely silenced that there was no room for dissent. And I guess also just procedurally, I, I, I know that there might be something I don't understand about presenting proponents or opponents, um, you know, when these things are brought to committee, but I would like to see my, um, the person representing my city government to be providing a balanced 
proposal that talks about the pros and the cons any time that a new proposal is being brought up. And part of my concern is that it has felt like there's a um, kind of whitewashing of things that's happened with many proposals where we don't get the full information about what the downside might be. And um, and if this is the way, you know, if this is your parliamentary procedure, whatever, fine. Um, but it feels um, not balanced. And, uh, and these decisions have tremendous impacts on residents that we can't undo. You know, we're once they're done, there's there's just no rolling them back. And there's no getting our trees back. There's no getting the buildings torn down back. Um, and, you know, a lot of other places are looking at us at really feeling like there's just unbridled, uncontrolled development. And our, you know, our pot shops is another indication of this. Um, so, uh, so I'm just talking about a bigger picture. And I think people who are in the neighborhood or who are concerned have good reason to be about what the next step is going to be. Thank you, Deborah. Is there anyone else who would like to speak uh, to this item before we go back to for question to answer some of the questions that were raised? Okay, let's go ahead. Um, Carolyn, would you like to speak to any of the questions? I did jot a few down. I don't know if you were able to. Um, sure. So I am. Um, I think. Um, that um i'm not i'm uh, you know i guess um <laughs> there were some points made that maybe makes sense to correct but if you have um specific questions i'd be happy to answer those i mean i think some of the concern about um demolition and planned village versus urban residential b could be clarified i mean the same review was required. Um, I think that um, there was a question about, um, I guess Barbara had a question about the um, the planned village zone and that hasn't changed. I think at the meeting that, um, and Barbara was at that meeting on uh, earlier this week, I think there was probably just a misunderstanding or miscommunication with Valley CDC that they thought it was urban residential B when they filed for the 23 Laurel Street. I don't know, I haven't talked to Laura Baker about that, but there's been no zoning um, amendment for that parcel except for the, um, smart growth overlay um, that was added to that um, a few years ago. Um, that was before the city purchased it back from the common or or had the land transfer back from the Commonwealth. It was originally the Northampton Housing Authority property um, and the Northampton Housing Authority was going to develop the area where 23 Laurel, the 23 Laurel Street parcel and they never could and so then it went back to the state then the city um wanted to um obtain it for the purposes of building affordable housing um so that overlay was added the one thing that's confusing i think is that originally the northampton housing authority property was not part of the special permit approved for the planned village area but it was still in the zoning and i think you know the folks who've said it tonight are, are it's true the idea was the planned village zone would be applied to the state um, hospital grounds um, because the idea was that's the land that was going to be um, disposed of by um, the Commonwealth. So um, that was definitely the land that was originally um, put under that zoning. Um, although the planned village um, zoning classification can be applied anywhere in the city. Um, so you can um, create sort of a planned unit development, if you will, is sort of the um, term that was used in the zoning previously. Um, that can be used anywhere, but in this case, it was initially applied to the state hospital lands. Um, and um, oh, I don't know if you can, if there are other questions that you have beyond yeah. that. Yeah, um, marijuana cultivation and odor oh, was, was a question. Yeah, so um, Plan Village does allow um, for processing, um, and any new buildings would require planning board permitting if they're more than 2,000 square feet. Um, 
any processing anywhere in the city, doesn't matter what district is in, needs to um, incorporate um, controls for um, odor controls. Um, and that's specified in the code um, to address that very issue because that, that certainly has been a concern in the city. Um, and the city council amended the zoning a few years ago to um, address that. Um, the, again, it's a small site um, and there may be, you know, I'm trying to think of a comparable small um, small facility that does something like that. I believe there's an um, an extraction um, oper um, function or operation on um, a Riverside Drive at the end there where it meets Nonatuck. So there are smaller locations where people are, are doing uh, small bits of processing, um, but not large not typically large manufacturing on such a small site. Um, so alternatives, there's so someone mentioned smart growth overlay or variances. I think I think you mentioned that mm -hmm. you know this could be done potentially with zoning variances, but uh, could you just speak again to the the reasoning as to why this is the better option in your view? Yes. Um, so variance, uh, I I. I wouldn't um, so variances would not be granted for this property. Um, a variance is is reserved for um, prod properties that are otherwise not usable due to some um, um, aspect of the site that makes it difficult to use or um, develop. It might be topography or streams or um, some other factor that affects that property versus others. There is a zoning board of appeals um, process that's not a variance that could um, be used to um, for an applicant to apply for any non-conforming use. So a use that does isn't allowed in the urban residential B district. And so comparing that to plan village zone where um, um, uh, someone made a comment about the fact that you don't, there's an unknown when you um, create a zoning district that allows a, a range of uses. Um, this, so that's pretty comparable to when you have a non-conforming use and you want um, to change it to any other use. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a use that's in, in the range listed when you already have a pre-existing non-conforming. You can go to the zoning board and ask for any use. So there's a lot of unknowns there as well, um, perhaps more unknowns because the range of potential uses is even broader than what would be um, identified in a planned village um, zoning classification. And so um, I think um, the other piece of it is that through the zoning process, you don't have the requirements that you um, bring the property up to um, the standards that the city has set for development with um, parking setback from the curb line, um, minimum open space, landscaping, uh, plantings, and so forth. So that wouldn't necessarily that would not necessarily be part of what would be required through a zoning board review, even though it would be part of a, a planning board review under the planned village permitting process. Great, and, and uh, I think the last one uh, was parking and traffic concerns that, that you know, would, would the, what if we had insufficient parking, for example, that was granted and then Slater found out that, okay, now we have a problem. Well, what sort of recourse would there be? Um, so part of the planning board's role is to evaluate the use and the layout and the, um, the orientation and the access. And, um, the, uh, the proponent needs to provide a rationale for why the parking is set up the way it is and how many spaces and show that it, it meets certain safety criteria. Um, if in the future a change um, 
were made or the or more parking was um, desire uh, was needed for the user or somebody had five cars instead of one or two, um, then yes, that person's going to be going to have to figure out where to sort of store their car. Um, there are um, there is on street parking allowed on um, Musanti, on Village Hill um, that isn't being used now that um, that's not fully occupied now during the day or in the evenings. Obviously, that's an issue um, typically when there's no emergency. So just like anywhere downtown, um, if someone has uh, vehicles that don't fit on their property, their, it's their responsibility to find out where to park those vehicles legally. Um, so that the same situation would be um, come into play. Um, there was a comment about the fact that there was a, an opinion that there wasn't enough parking provided for the 23 Laurel Street project. That, but they do, sh they did show that they had the um, two parking spaces per, uh, I'm sorry, they just had about one parking space per unit. And they also showed that they, um, um, from data from their own client base that um, they um, had, are providing more parking than um, the minimum required. So that's an evaluation and requirement to, that when it comes forward in front of the board that um, the planning board um, considers those factors that are presented by the applicant. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, uh, Karen, were there, as, as a sponsor of this, uh, did you want to answer any questions or address anything that was brought up? Uh, thank you for the opportunity, but, but no, I um, feel comfortable with the, the way Director Mish answered the questions and I, I don't have additional information. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions from the from the committee? Yes, Jim. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, just to, to follow up. So, um, Carolyn and and Karen, there's no on street parking on this particular around this particular block. Is that correct? Not on Prince or Chapel Street, um, but right across the way where the um, BMH building is, Musanti Drive has um, on-street parking um, that goes, you know, heads north. And those are marked parking spaces that are rarely used. And is there a possibility of on-street parking along here or... I mean, I, I've been looking at Google Maps, the roadway design. It looks like it got redesigned, I'd say in the last 10 years, something like that. Um, but that, um, yeah, it doesn't look like there's any immediate on-street parking for this property or any of the properties on, um, on Chapel or Prince, if I have the names right. Is that correct? Correct, and it was redesigned and rebuilt um, as part of the uh, mass developments requirements for the redevelopment of the state hospital, um, and as well as those other street connections where Musanti comes out to. At that point, it might just be changing to Burt's Pit. I don't know exactly where the boundary is, but um, I don't. I believe you're right that there isn't any, but I haven't looked to see if there's a code that restricts it um, in the code of ordinances, but I can do that. Um, um, yeah, it would be I could offer a little info there if that's helpful. Yeah, along um, Burst Pit where you see the FFR, that's the um, community gardens. Yeah. And it's uh, squishy as to whether or not um, street <laughs> parking is allowed there. So. Um, it's not officially street parking allowed there, though there is a precedent for cars being parked on the street there. So there's no prohibition. I, I wouldn't go that far, Counselor. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, and the uh, and um, so the this this limitation of on street parking, Carolyn, would be considered as part of the planning board's process to determine if a plan is is sufficient for this site is that is that fair to say 
Yeah. So a business that would depend on on-street parking or a lot of stop and go traffic, maybe like a convenience store or something like that, it would need to be handled on site because it's not going to happen on the seat on the street. Right. Although it depends. I mean, you know, we, um, I think you could make an argument that the Musanti Drive has um, underutilized parking and that um, there could be overflow parking there, at least when there's not a snow emergency, because um, we never want to require more impervious surface when there's existing impervious surface. And we also know that on-street parking slows traffic. So there's some benefits to having on-street parking. Um, so it, all of those factors though would be considered by the planning board um, and whether or not it was sort of um, an appropriate rationale to um, incorporate into the review. Thank you. And, and, and I have one more follow-up, which has to do with, um, it was a question, one of the uh, speakers mentioned the idea of uh, saying, basically, can we get a proposal and then change the zoning? Okay. And, um, and Carolyn, could you speak to why that's not preferred or? Um, yeah, I mean, the whole idea is you're creating zoning now, but with a rationale that it makes sense as a zoning category and that it will change over time. I mean, we're cities change and evolve and they're always changing and evolving. And you don't know what today's, if today's use is going to last, you know, for five years, one year, 10 years. And so the, the range of uses is what you're approving, not a particular project. Um, and so if you and you can't create essentially a contract zone, you can't say, I like this person's proposal, therefore, let's change the zoning for that proposal. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's not allowed, but also it doesn't it, it doesn't make much sense because that person could say, you know what? Um, you know, um, rice pudding isn't working for me, in me anymore. I'm going to sell and go and do something else. Um, so you know, the zoning is really set up to say, okay, this is the, this is, these are the range of uses that are appropriate in this location. And that's what we're looking for because it's also future looking, you know, you want to set it up so that it's not just based on one or a temporal kind of um, modification. Thank you. That's it for me. So yes, uh, Stan. Uh, thanks. Carolyn, has Planned Village been uh, used on any other properties uh, in Northampton besides the State Hospital, former State Hospital? <clears throat> no, we have not adopted in any other location it, um, until about probably 10 years ago. The, the next logical place, and it, it probably won't come around again, but, you know, it we were thinking that maybe it would be appropriate for the um, veterans hospital before that became an important piece of the puzzle for um, people with PTSD and they started treating people there and it looked like, okay, this is gonna be a permanent hospital. Um, but that was the only other location it, since I've been with a city that we were sort of thinking might be the, a logical um, place to um, incorporate that zoning. So this would be this would be the first then that would extend while it's abutting the former state hospital is would extend beyond the the original borders. Um, yes, this is the first. Uh, I think it's the first expansion of the boundaries. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from counselors? Counselors, how are we feeling about, do we want to, do we have all the information that we need? Are, are we ready to close the public hearing? Okay, and seeing no more questions, um, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I'd so move. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, roll call, please. Oh, you're muted. Uh, 
Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Okay, the public hearing is now closed. Um, we a, could we have a five minute recess, Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Uh, Thank we you. will return at, I would say, 8.02. Thank you. Perfect timing. I have a kid who's not in bed and should, should be moving that way. <laughs> <laughs>
Laura, um, we had a couple of folks leave and come back. I think uh, Solicitor Seawald and well, Councillor yeah. Foster. Well, you can make them co-hosts again. Sure. My clocks don't match. In the other room, I was sitting there, oh, I got like two minutes left. <laughs> Laura, how are okay. you doing? I'm doing okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's 8.02. Welcome back to Legislative Matters Committee. We have closed the public hearing. Now is, it is our time to deliberate and we can continue to ask questions of uh, the sponsors but we will not be hearing further from the public. Oh, counselors. Uh, Jim. Thank you. I, you know, um, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I, I am supportive of this, this change and that, um, and that I really appreciated um, all of the, um, the details that um, that Carolyn shared um, that there was a lot of the, 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 there's it's it's a complicated change and um, and I think we got a we got the answers we need to make a decision here. I also want to say that I, I really appreciated um, Councillor Foster's uh, work that she's put into this and um and in her remarks they they were very convincing for me and 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 I want to reiterate that um that I, I really appreciated the line she drew that she's she's supportive of this change but not the idea of, of it going further which is clearly a concern of of many of the people who spoke tonight um that um that yeah, I heard two things. They were concerned about what was going to happen on the site with the new zoning, but they were concerned that this was the start of something. And and I heard from their counselor that um, that uh, they any changes wouldn't have uh, her support. And 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 I think based on all of the information that that Carolyn shared. With, that I wouldn't anticipate that happening, and it would be a much rougher um, uh, push to make that that happen. So um, that's yeah. So I, I I I had some other thoughts in there. They'll come back to me. So, but um, that's that's my opening thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So uh, I have a question actually for Solicitor Seawald, um, I believe is, is here. Um, and that, that question has to do with the, the jurisdiction of the planning board in regard to the special permit and kind of what, um, I'm not sure what the word is, but what, what the, the authority that they have uh, in order to, to, to make decisions, you know, to have this, the, whatever use whatever design uh, is harmonious with, with the, the rest of the, the neighborhood. Um, I wonder if, if he is available to speak to that at all. Um, <clears throat> good evening. I'm happy evening. to speak to Welcome. that. I hope you don't mind if I keep my camera off. I'm still recovering from knee surgery. and You'd see me laying on my couch. Uh, you don't need to see me laying on my couch. Um, no problem. So, and so, um, you know, there are several um, tools that zoning uses to give boards some discretion um, in the particular development or redevelopment of a site. Um, you know, you have site plan approval and special permit are the two most common. Um, and so when you're dealing in the, in the realm of a special permit, um, there are certain uses that are designated only for, um, for special, by special permit. And in that situation, the, there are a set of criteria and our ordinances have special permit criteria and you go down the criteria and, you know, as long as the planning board or other permit granting authority um, is applying those uh, criteria in a rational way, 
um, there's a lot of discretion. So, you know, on an appeal from a decision granting a permit, a special permit, uh, a judge is not going to um, substitute his or her discretion for the board's discretion. The board has the discretion, as long as that discretion is done procedurally properly and applies to uses that are special permit uses and is done in a rational um, way, uh, it's going to be upheld. Great, thank you. Yeah, that, 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 that was kind of my question. It's essentially, you know, are we trusting the planning board and, and the special permit criteria that the planned village was established with uh, to create a, a appropriate use on this site? Um, and, you know, from, from what I'm hearing, um, I, I do feel comfortable moving forward with that. Um, and I, you know, I, I think we have to think about the neighborhood and, and the city uh, as a whole in making these decisions. And um, I think that this, you know, will will bring um, will 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 bring appropriate uses to, to the site. And I especially thank uh, Karen Foster for for her thoughts uh, on on that. So, uh, Marissa. Hi, um, I, um, I, I first want to say um, also to um, to Karen, um, thank you very much. Um, it was very uh, enlightening uh, to hear everything that you uh, you did to uh, engage with your ward and and the neighborhood and uh, end with the issue um, and to and to um, come up to speed on what is a little bit of a complicated issue and it's not necessarily a clear cut. Um, I also appreciate the, uh, the flight of curiosity that the planning board, uh, took to engage with the bigger question, but I don't think that they, um, I, I doubt, I doubt very much that, well, first of all, to the extent it wasn't clear for anybody who had, who watched that meeting, I, I, I they, they didn't suffer under any, uh, misunderstanding about the limits of what they were voting on, um, or voting to recommend, um, and um, I appreciated um, sort of the lar larger conversation and what it in inspired. It definitely does show that there is reason to be thoughtful about whether or not um, making this change, this limited change that's before us could um, go uh, further down the road um, to other changes. That being said, I, I have to say, I, I very much uh, concur with um, Karen's assessment of it, which is to say that that it it does it has always seemed to me that that particular parcel um, was a bit of an outlier, both in its neighborhood and the, the, the sort of the physical little <laughs> area that it's in, and then also an outlier in what it could have been if it had been a, if it had been possible to bring it in at the time that um, Village Hill was uh, being uh, uh, dreamt up um, by uh, all, all the folks who put it together and touched that project between the city and developers and the planning planning board and various entities um, that played a role in that civic process. So, so with that said, I have to say I am I am I am comfortable that this is appropriately limited to a, a very quirky and weird spot uh, in our city that also is in its own way prominent uh, in terms of sort of where it is in terms of traffic and traffic flow and its entrance to the, the Village Hill neighborhood. Um, and um, that, uh, you know, so sort of from the at-large perspective, I do actually see some 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 bigger implications to um, pulling this into this limited uh, village um, zoning. Um, that that I, I do think would would be could be and will be it, if it's ever even proposed at all. I, I have some doubts. I understand the concern, but I I have real doubts that um, it's very likely to come back before council in terms of enlarging that. But um, but if it ever does, it certainly will be considered on its own merits, and that this is not the beginning of a, a slippery slope. So um, I. And I guess the, the one last thing I would say is, is that, and, and Carolyn, if you can please correct me if I'm wrong, I'd ask you to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, within it's, it's uh, the, the current zone, if, if a developer wanted to drop a bunch of money and just conform 
with what is absolutely required and bring it in compliance, then it, it in some in some ways it's much more limited review. Um, am I am I correct about that? Um. So the review would probably, I mean, anything more than a single family house, anything more than a single family house that's more than 2,000 square feet would also require planning board review. Um, uh, however, um, the, um, there aren't the same design criteria as there are at State Hospital at Village Hill for the design criteria. Um, the other piece is if they weren't going to fix all the non-conforming aspects of the property it would require zoning board and planning board, which is another potential barrier for redevelopment and, and therefore a cost um, barrier for that. So that's, um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but those are the, um, two processes, but certainly the plan village has more um, design review um, requirements than urban residential B. Right, it's, it, are the design requirements also included if, if it's a single family home? I mean, hypothetically? Yes, anything that's in the plan village zone also gets reviewed in that context, yep. By planning board? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so that so that does answer my question in the in some way. I know somebody um, expressed some concerns. Well, actually, I have one more question for you, Carolyn. Um, um, it was stated very broadly that there's any use, but it it's mixed use, but it's not unlimited use, correct? Well, well it's quite a range. So it's office. It could be retail. Um, we also allow industrial uses in the planned village, but. It's limited to the constraints of the parcel for sure and mm -hmm. access. Um, so safe, safe um, vehicular access and um, meeting the layout requirements for um, and accommodating um, for pedestrian scale development because that's part of the requirement of that. So, um, and the, the premise behind Plan Village really is to focus more on those um, details the way the buildings and st structures frame the street and function versus what's going on inside them mm -hmm. so much. Okay. Um, so with, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for um, clarifying those things. So I, I have to say that I, um, the other part about recognizing this as a quirky parcel is just what Carolyn said also, which is that I think what could conceivably be done with this um, is is pretty pretty limited, and I and the planning board is going to have a little bit more say so um, than if than un other under other circumstances. So, I'm I'm comfortable with this zoning change. I would be uh, I'd be uh, moving and and voting. Uh, I, I would so move, but um, if we're not there yet, but I would I would be looking to uh, send this to full council with a positive recommendation. Uh, yeah, you're welcome to go ahead and make that motion. We can continue the discussion. Oh, yes. Uh, then let's go ahead and do it. I would move that we move this forward with a positive recommendation. I'll second and then would like to speak to it. Go ahead, Stan. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I appreciate everyone who spoke tonight, uh, particularly the neighbors, making us aware of, of your concerns about uh, a neighborhood that's been been undergoing changes and Further changes are coming, and in particular around the uncertainty of what may happen to this particular piece of property. The, the problem I see is that it's it's a non-conforming use, and because of that, there could be a proposal for another non-conforming use that wouldn't have as as uh, as tight as comprehensive a review as I think what will happen under. Under Plan Village, so I'm I I don't I don't see that by not changing the zoning is going to remove that element of uncertainty. The 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 other thing that carries a lot of weight with me is uh, the ward councilor, uh, Councilor Foster, who spoke I thought very clearly about her support for this particular parcel. And as, as others have mentioned, uh, she, she would not support the extension of Plan Village 
uh, any further in, uh, in this neighborhood. So for those reasons, I too will uh, support this. Any other discussion? Jim. Yeah, a, a follow-up question, just so I have this right, Carolyn. Um, so the any future development would, would have to build up to the street or it would be encouraged? Um, it would be encouraged, but again, it, it depends on the layout and the, um, and what's, what's proposed between the street and that structure. Um, but yes, it's, it's um, the idea is that you're framing the street and that also helps sort of create that, you know, close, uh, create that sort of space of village um, context. So, um, you know, there are examples. So even across the street, the building was, um, pulled back a little bit, but it's still, there's no, you know, there's no parking between the building and the street. The parking is behind. Um, and uh, the same would be for that parcel that's remaining in front of the DMH building. Well, and that also in terms of the URB setbacks actually would require that, that a lot of the property not be used by, with a building. And that, um, and so it, in my mind, that it would encourage, um, it would it, it would encourage more vehicles being parked all over the the property, rather than um, uh, something that allows for more of the property to be filled up with a building. Right. And right. that, so it, it it'll be less like a. It, it it kind of helps rule out the possibility of going towards a gas station or a convenience place that looks like a like a highway type of operation. Um, I mean, it's not saying those things couldn't happen there, but or, or at least with a convenience store, but it wouldn't be looking like that traditional convenience store out on the highway. It would look something more like it fits into the village. I see you nodding yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. That so anyway, and yeah, that yeah, it's a terribly quirky situation where the the current zoning really kind of renders the 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 possibilities very. It, it's very limited. So by changing it, it really opens up a lot of doors, and um, and that the use of this property is greatly enhanced. So, thanks. Thank you all. And yeah, I would just second what the concern other counselors have brought up around the, um, <clears throat> you know, that the zoning board of appeals could, could grant another non-conforming use without the design guidelines that Planned Village has. Um, so if there's no other discussion, uh, let's go ahead with a roll call on this positive recommendation. Councilor Moulton. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. Yes. Okay, that positive recommendation passes unanimously. And we will move on to 22.159, an ordinance to amend section 312-36, which is parking meter locations and regulations. And um, looking at the history of this, uh, <clears throat> This has been referred to the Transportation and Parking Commission and to us, the um, Transportation and Parking Commission had it, gave a neutral recommendation um, with uh, some changes, which we have the text of those changes. Um, and um, some notes uh, that Nancy Forrestal voiced concerns about staffing considerations, technology limitations and revenue impacts that should be vetted further. Uh, Carolyn Mish is here to speak to this item uh, for us. Uh, Carolyn, would you like to present? Sure. Um, so the the parking um, this was um, submitted uh, as a follow up to lots of discussion on um, about. Um, 
Main Street and encouraging turnover of parking spaces. We, in the city engaged Jason Schreiber of Santec to come back and sort of do another assessment of parking. I think it was seven years ago. They initially, there were some recommendations made by another firm the city hired about modifying the parking fee structure and some of those items were implemented and others um, were not. Um, so this was a, a way to take um, ha allow some time to pass and take another look and address some of the concerns of the business community in downtown about um, wanting to ensure that there were enough parking spaces available for customers who want to, um, in particular, park close to um, the store location. So um, Santec evaluated, gave a, gave a report, and many of you may have been at those public forums regarding this, but there was quite a bit of support for the recommendations coming out of that to um, tweak the hours of um, parking enforcement and um, uh, payment. So right now, typically the downtown or most of the downtown is on a, a the parking meters start um, uh, being um, regulated at 8 a.m. and they go to 6 p.m. So there's a, a discussion about shifting that to 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, to capture more of when people, when the demand is. And this is really about managing demand of spaces and encouraging turnover with um, adjustments in the parking um, rate. So you'll see that there's also a recommendation to break to have a certain rate at the earlier part of the day and then increase that rate to later in the day to encourage that turnover. Um, and the fees also go up. So um, on Main Street, but they drop on the side streets. And the idea is that if people are perfectly happy to um, uh, walk a little bit further and they're more price sensitive, they'll park where it's a little bit less expensive and allow those spaces on Main Street that are sort of the prime parking spaces, free those up. So um, the, the, that, was, that's the, um, that report and recommendation is um, uh, what led to this zoning, um, sorry, this code amendment. And um, there was a lot of discussion with the parking management staff. So Nancy Forstall was definitely part of the conversation, had no issues with the recommend with the, the recommendations coming from Stantec, noted that there might be some staffing shifts and some adjustments to um, those hours because you know the staff is used to starting up at eight and finishing at six. So there's definitely that um, component that um, she identified. Um, and so we, so working forward, this text also um, in not just um, creating sort of variables and, and rate changes during the day, uh, plus extending the hours of parking, it also institutes a different way of um, evaluating whether or not this um, parking is performing, the, the parking rate structure is performing um, to the goals of the system and the goals being to try to maintain about an 85% occupancy. Um, I'm sorry, 85% um, um, right occupancy on the street at um, you know for most averaging out most times during the week, and so we don't know if these um, numbers will achieve that. So the idea is to give. Um, a tool to the mayor's office with um, um, conversation with tra transportation and parking to allow this to be adjusted up or down in order to maintain that that optimal um, occupancy rate and it, it's a little bit more nimble of a procedure than having to come back through city council to tweak the um, the rate structure so that's also part of this amendment um, and then the tables, the reason why it's so long is we had to modify all um, the table and classifications of the parking areas um, in order to make all these what seemingly um, would be um, just a few 
changes to the rates and the hours, it really sort of is embedded throughout these two parking sections. So that's why there's so many um, pages to this ordinance amendment, just to make sure that we got that right. And then the final thing at the very last page uh, relates to the roundhouse lot, which um, you all know was recently rebuilt um, and paved. And so the parking striping, the number of parking spaces has changed and there have been new parking spaces added that were never codified so that line item on the last page adds the rest of the um, roundhouse parking lot that was never um, put in the code so that fixes that piece um, what i could what i think will be helpful is to put the map on the screen to sort of locate where we're talking about these um, rate adjustments so i don't know if laura you want me to do that or if you can put that map up let's see um, okay one second here we go Is this the right one? Yeah. Yeah, that looks like it. Okay. So, Carolyn, were you going to just describe this? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was having audio problem on my earbuds. Okay. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so this map is um, shows if you look um, here um, on one A, which is sort of the magenta color along Main Street. Um, that's where um, uh, the that's Main Street, obviously, and that's where there would be sort of the biggest change. Um, the rates would go up. Um, on Main Street and then go a little bit higher in the evening. And then 1B, which are the green slashes, represents the side streets where the, the rates would drop during that same time. And so as Jason Schreiber described it, it's sort of um, creating um, incentive to park on the side streets for people who, who can. And um, then there were some other adjustments to all the parking lots as well to make them to the parking garage rates would go up a little bit because he evaluated sort of the whole system and said, you know, you're not getting, it, it's, it's far too cheap to park in these places. And that's what's creating sort of the, in some places there's too much parking and not enough term, turnover because of this. So um, he actually did review this draft before we sent it to and introduced it to city council and certainly was saying, you know, there's no, there's not like a magic bullet, but that's why the, the um, that it's worth a try to see how this adjustment affects the parking and then to give the flexibility to the mayor's office to say, well, you know, after six months of this, looking at two different time periods, this isn't working and we need to adjust things down or maybe we need to adjust them more. So um, this map is not part of the code, but it's really in, uh, um, it's sort of just a visual aid for, um, for the code and the parking um, system um users can certainly have it we can post it on our website too for people to understand better how this whole thing works um or where it's delineated so the one issue that um nancy raised at the um transportation and parking meeting was um you know besides staffing um was that there are some places where there are old meter systems and we haven't done a detailed assessment about the dimension on the sidewalk as to whether we can put kiosks in. And the difference is that we really need to, um, the, the kiosk pay system or the mobile app are the two um, tools that allow us to be very flexible in the timing and the rate structure. So we can have different 
rates at different times during the day using the electronic pay systems, but the old meters um, don't have that ability to, um, to change the pay rate internally. There's no computer that says, okay, it's now six o'clock and we're gonna put flash up on the screen that it costs X more dollars, which means that we'd have to install, replace the meters with kiosks. So that's definitely an expense and it's a management um, function that we would have to, you know, um, implement on the administrative side. And we just, um, I think um, Nancy wanted to just make sure that, you know, that it was clear that we hadn't um, really evaluated other creative solutions of physically posting a kiosk on some of those street segments, because there are some sections of sidewalk that are narrow. So we are probably gonna have to come up with other ways of dealing um, with the fact that it may be complicated to put um, a kiosk stanchion in some of the, on some of those side streets. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, sorry, did you say that the garage rates would be going up? Or just the monthly fee, because that's all I see. The monthly fee. Yeah, the monthly fee is whatever. Yeah. Okay. The, the garage, fee. however, will yeah. remain at seventy-five cents an hour with the first hour free. Right. Right. Okay. Jim. Thank you, um, Carolyn. It, and it's weird. It, we just need to acknowledge it's weird that Car Carolyn is here talking <laughs> about parking because, but it's part of the new job, I guess, right? <laughs> Um, We're the catch-all department. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, next you'll be out checking out different sites going, you know, things, projects going in around the city. Yeah. So um, in terms of, all right, so the changes in hours, that, that makes sense. Um, the, the changes in rates are, so I, are the rate the, the ranges are they reflected in this um, or is that something that the mayor is going to develop later? I mean, I see fees in 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 here, but it seems to reflect the old fees or maybe proposed new fees. I yeah. So everything that's um, well on this one that I'm looking at is orange. Everything that's orange and underlined on page two of the ordinance. Yeah. Um, or stricken are the modifications. So it on the in the so it's also been reorganized to put the time limits, the class um, of uh, what we're referring to as a class, a time limit, the span, meaning the hours of the day, and then the fee sort of in one table. Mm -hmm. So that's a little that's sort of merging two different sections. Um, so the fee under the fee column. It, you'll note, so in class 1A, it goes from a dollar to a dollar 50 per hour. Mm -hmm. And then from that's from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then from 5 p.m., it should say till. Um, oh, I see. It should say till 8, um, 8 p.m. is $2 per hour in 25% mm -hmm. increment. So the fees are there, but what's changing, and so that's what you would be voting on in this um, amendment, but um, the other piece that's changing is section five below that at the bottom of page three, where it says, um, you know, that notwithstanding um, subsection E above, uh, the mayor's authorized to develop regulations with set time and fees for the schedule, so um, with the um, goal of maintaining an average of 85% occupancy. So that's the piece that would then be added that's not, not now part of your, part of the ordinance. And that's to give more of a performance um, based evaluation instead of just sort of a static caught, you know, fee structure and time structure. And then I will also say that, um, the other thing that Jason suggested is not to have these two hour limits that people sort of, um, you know, panic and say, oh, my God, I got to go run feed the meter. It really means that, you know, the rate goes up. So, for example, in class 1A, we're not there's not a, there wouldn't be a two hour limit anymore, but you'd be paying more per hour. 
So if you're staying three, you can stay three hours, you can stay four hours. The theory being, it's not that we don't want you to park there, but if you're going to park in a premium space, you'll pay a premium fee. But if you if you want to park three hours on the side street, you know it's going to be half the cost of, or you know even uh, more um, to to spend more time on the side streets than on Main Street. Um, so there's an elimination of those the maximum time that you can park. And that addresses, you know, complaints that um, we get from people from out of town who want to come and spend a whole day, but not have to worry about moving their car or feeding the meter um, necessarily, or you know, switching spaces so that they get they restart their two-hour limit. Um, on top of that, by eliminating the maximum time limit, we also had to add language that. Um, define sort of what does it mean to um, to stay for all day parking. It doesn't mean you can stay all week or all month. There is a there is a total time limit that you can occupy a space. Um, and um, in some cases, you know, we don't allow overnight parking. Of course, it's no emergencies. All of this is is moot anyway. Um, but that's also part of this is sort of um, uh, creating better definition of what it means to not have, um, you know, a parking time limit. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot here. And, you know, I, I just want to go back to the the uh, section five about um, uh, it, allowing the mayor so to set the rates. And I'm that. I, I'm, I'm just hearing in my my ear, you know, a number of counselors before me saying, you know, that that the roadways and the uh, public way are um, in the council's domain, and that um, I I'm wondering if there's a way that um, that that the mayor could come to us and. I, where I'd be comfortable is like the mayor, the mayor saying, here's the range that I'm asking you to approve. It might be here and it might be here and, and, and allow me to do the work with, with city staff to, to get to this 85%. Um, I, I, it just, that's, that's, that, that's a piece that I, I, I think that can be worked out. Um, and that we can honor the, the mayor's wish to have that flexibility, but also at the same time, council could, um, you know, be the, 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 the final uh, body weighing in on um, setting those rates. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I'm, so the other thing, and, and Carolyn, I'm asking you this, <laughs> Um, and I know this is probably all new to you. So I'm picturing parking in a, I'm in a parking space. Now, if I have the, the app on my phone, I'm sitting in a restaurant and it's saying, oh, your time is up. If you want to keep parking here, it's going to cost, you know, so much. Otherwise you'll get a ticket. Um, but how would it, so it would largely this being able to extend your time would be through the pay by plate or pay by your phone app, right? Right, I think uh, it's my understanding and I'm sorry that I don't know the technology intimately enough. I, 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 I don't blame you. And <laughs> yeah, cause I'm trying to figure out this idea of like, yeah, if you just wanna like the parking garage, it makes sense. It's like, yeah, my car's in the garage, I'll go back later, it'll cost more, but I don't have to worry about getting a ticket. It's taking that same idea and applying it to on-street parking, but what's gonna stop somebody saying, hey, I'm just gonna pull out of here and, you know, I, I it's the um, ticket. I, I guess maybe Nancy would know the answer to that, how that mechanism is gonna work or, uh, I mean, there's um, the, she certainly said that the technology was there to do that in okay. the app and the, and the pay by plate. Mm -hmm. um, 
exactly how it does that. I don't know, but maybe you pay, you know, maybe you say, I'm going to stay here two hours. And then the app says, you're coming up on your two hours. Do you want more time? Right. Um, and then you pay more time. And so if you haven't paid, then the meters, out, then, you know, the people looking at the meters out on the streets see that you haven't paid. And so then there would be enforcement taken for that time that's not paid okay. right, is then, what I imagine um, how it would work. Yeah, I, I think getting more clarity on that would be helpful for me. And um, let me see what else was here. Um, um, anybody else getting tired? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> oh, so if you know what, I, I think there's just like I, I have questions about like if I, you know, if I park on Pleasant Street and I'm willing to walk into town, you know, so the, the rate is automatically going up at a certain or, or goes down at a certain time. So I know I'm getting a discount by parking there. So. Yeah, I, I, I guess I just want to better figure out how, how all of that I would. So I want to better figure out how all of these adjustments actually happen. And and also that that piece about, you know, the mayor coming to council and saying, here's the range of rates. You know, it could be something like with the water rates. The mayor comes to us, you know, uh, once a year and says, here's here's the recommended water rates. And um, and if for the range for for different sized uh, pipes and things and um, and meters and um, we could do something similar here where there's a review process, um, but that the the council still has that role of doing the review um, and approving. So, um, but I I I just want to say this: I did attend the the. Um, the presentation by the the parking consultants. I think this is a great idea. It's it's just really the the devils in the details of how it's going to work, and being able to explain it to people and to myself, so I know what I'm voting on. So um, I will say, you know, if there is an interest in for council to sort of and understand what sort of the maximum. Hey, um, fee might be. You could also add language to this that says, you know, the the mayors um, can adjust this up or down to maintain eighty five percent occupancy, and then just set a maximum. It, it, but mm -hmm. if it's more than a fifty percent increase <clears throat> from the existing rates, it comes back to city council or something like that. Um, because the whole idea is to, you know, um, be as nimble as possible to address the demands, the street, you know, the market demands. And, you know, maybe we don't, maybe this isn't the right number. So it needs to be tweaked down or maybe it's still not the right number. It needs to go up a little bit. Um, the idea is really not necessarily to, although I'm sure someone could try to, to make, you know, put make it $10 an hour or something, but that's not really going to accomplish much good. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's an option, I guess you could think about. I like the circuit breaker idea as well, but it, it seems like we have some, some things to figure out here. So um, I, I, I'm going to stop hogging the floor. And I'm, talking, I'm sure everybody's got something to say about it. Yes, yeah. Dan, go ahead. Well, I appreciate the concept of, of nimbleness, but I can't imagine that um, the mayor or anyone else is going to want to be changing rates on a on a monthly basis. I mean, I would think that this would be done maybe once or, or maybe twice a year. And I, 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 I kind of agree with Jim that I think that the council needs to be the uh, the court of last resort uh, on approving uh, approving parking uh, rates. So I, I guess I do you know, Carolyn, was this a, a sort of a major part of the consultants recommendations that the uh, that the authority be be moved to the mayor? Um, it was it was um, a strong recommendation. 
Um, and it really just so that um, there's, you know, um, this was introduced in August. It's now the end of, you know, middle of October. And so that timing, um, you know, you might lose some capacity there, some, uh, you know, some um, either parking or um, parking opportunities, I guess, in that two to three month time period. So that's really the issue is the timing of going through the um, ordinance review process. Uh, my other question is uh, Nancy Forrestal's um, concerns. I think you've addressed two of them, staffing and technology. What about the revenue impact? I mean, I, what she noted was there, um, we, you know, we won't know till we know, but I mean, the, the rates are going to go up in certain, some places and drop in others. So the, so we won't know for sure what the revenue impact is. Um, I don't think she was making a judgment as to the fact that we are going to lose revenue or, or that she had any knowledge about, you know, that we were going to lose revenue. I think really what she was saying is um, whenever there's an adjustment, it, there's, you know, likelihood that the revenue will change, whether it's up or down, it's not clear. Okay, thank you. Marissa, did I see your hand? Yeah, you did. Um, I guess I, I have to say, I, I, I'm sensitive to the con concern about council oversight. I guess it seems to me though that, um, um, that there, there could be that we could maintain oversight by by putting in sort of circuit breakers, uh, as as Jim put it, um, that kind of kept the parameters, and that if we went outside the parameters, then it would have to come back to council. Um, because I, I mean, I personally am a little skeptical that folks are are so cost conscious that that like fiddling around with a quarter an hour or 50 cents an hour is going to make that big of a difference. But, um, and I think people are going to lose their minds when they can't park for free after six. <laughs> uh, but that's another story for another day, I think. Um, but, um, I, you know, so in, in general, I'm, I'm, I, I'm in favor of uh, adjusting the parking this way. I guess my, I, my other question though is, are, so are we talking about uh putting this with a neutral recommendation forward with some proposed um change to the to the to the language before it goes back to council or are we talking about giving it a, i mean i i guess it's just like what's the mechanism here in in terms of it seems to be a do or do not sort of situation um if 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 we're gonna if somebody's gonna propose an amendment or an amendment to the statute to put in a circuit breaker or something like that. What procedurally, how does that happen here? Yeah, we we have we have several options here. You know, we we can put a recommendation. We can put a recommendation that um, with specific language or or without that that suggests that you know this be looked at further by the full council on um, some fashion. Or um, we, you know we can delay our recommendation. Um, and take this up in another meeting once we've gathered more information. Our duty to report, you know, there's a certain time time frame, and I don't think we've reached that time frame um, for our duty to report. So I, th I think we have a number of, of options here. And I will say, um, yeah, if we're if we're I, I I don't as a counselor I don't want to be involved in tiny changes to the to the to the fee structure, I, I love the idea of it being dynamic and being adapted. It sounds like, according to the language, it's it's every six months. It's in December and in July. Was that correct? Um, yeah. To do July, an evaluation. December. Yeah. Right to do the evaluation, but could it be? Um, and so it, it probably it sounds like it wouldn't be adjusted more than every six months based on that language? Yeah, I think the idea is to have enough of a block of time to gather um, you know, information that would be meaningful. 
Um, and um, so it, the idea is to take a summer period and then around the holidays so that, you know, because those are different, um, we have different influxes of people coming to the city during those different periods of time. Right. So I, you know, I, I feel comfortable with something of the nature of, you know, within a certain percentage or a certain maximum, um, whether that's, you know, $3 since we're currently seeing $2 as a maximum uh, or whether that's 50%, which would uh, give more flexibility over the longer term if we said, you know, by 50% each year. And if it started to go on a trend we didn't like, we can move some legislation back that that says no. Here's here's the limit. Um, so I'm not. Do, does anyone? How, how do what do other counselors think about that? And and do we have a sense of what of a recommendation on 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 that? Stan, Alex, I like the percentage because that's that's easier to. Uh to apply to all the, the varying fees. Um, and I think that would be, uh, that would take care of the concerns that have been raised that it not, it not fluctuate beyond a certain percentage. My concern with that would be with some of the very low figures like 25 cents an hour, you couldn't move that to 50 if it was say, if it no more than a 50% change. Um, so that's, there, there's, there's some implications we'd want to think through, um, about using a percentage, uh, unless we, yeah, it's just my, my thought there. Well, or base, base any percentage on, I mean, we're talking about what? 50 cents, a buck 50, you know, the, I mean, we can make that percentage pretty high and it would still effectively, I mean, if we get to the point where parking in downtown Northampton is getting crazy and we are talking about five or $10 um, because, you know, the Red Sox are playing in town, um, then <laughs> I mean, then maybe we, maybe at that point we could adjust the, the percentage, but, but maybe it is the case that like we can set a pretty high bar um and that 50 percent wouldn't be out of wouldn't be crazy i mean it, if the red sox were playing in town we'd probably, there'd be other things to consider about that i think <laughs> we'd have other problems we have other problems <laughs> uh so uh I, so do we want to i don't have the legislation in front of me do we it, are there thoughts about whether or not that kind of um, that kind of language? I'm looking at the um, specific ordinance where we might put that language where we might put that language in. I think it would go in section five uh, which mm -hmm. is on page three. Thank you. A, a, sen a sentence then I think uh, would be uh, uh, up if, if we if we take the 50% uh, up to 50% uh, increase uh, will be filed with the city clerk. Anything above a 50% increase would go to the city council for approval. Well, or we could just say, uh... Or we could just say adjustments shall be made by the, uh, on average 85% occupancy rates, uh, da, 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 not to exceed uh, a 50% increase in any one, for any one increase or over a period of a year, right? Or something, you know, like. I think that's still a Councilor Jarrett's um, uh, concern about the rates where that are 25 sense so you might want to pick 75 percent or something like that because that will allow an nice adjustment now. yeah yeah i would actually say 100 percent because then you're you can take those 25s and bring them to 50 
Mm-hmm. Oh right, yeah. Anything else, you 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 don't get a good round number to bring them to. Right. Yeah. So I think we're dealing with numbers. All of the parking fees are low enough that we could, as long as they don't double, they don't more than double. Right. Is that enough of a restriction? I I feel comfortable. Keep the mayor in check. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) you know, it allows for that flexibility, but it doesn't seem likely we're going to start charging $4 an hour park on Main Street, so... Yeah. Personally, as a, as a political matter, I'm happy to have the mayor be the one to raise parking rates. That's, uh... <laughs> That's a very good point, Councillor Elkins, <laughs> that, you know, $4 an hour for parking would be on the front page. And um, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that will be its own uh, circuit breaker. But uh, so do we so not to exceed uh, uh, a 100 percent increase? Yes, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Um, we don't yet have a recommendation on the floor, um, so I don't think we can do an amendment without without starting that. Does anyone want to make that recommendation and then propose? So I'd move for a positive recommendation. I'll, I'll second. And are we are we moving the version? Uh, Subsequent to the uh, the uh, transportation and parking um, amendments, right? A positive recommendation. Oh, let me amend my. Uh, I move a positive recommendation uh, with the amendments um, following the 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 transportation committee's meeting, as second. as put forward on our agenda. I put second. Some words in there. Make sure we get them all down, Laura. Make sure. We- okay. We make this motion as long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so just to clarify, because the document, so there's there's what's written in our agenda that, that talks about um, how, with some corrections. And then there's the document which sort, which highlights maybe where it should be corrected, where it says 9 p.m., looking on, you know, page three and um page two but it doesn't actually change them there to it to the 8 p.m that it that it should be so i just want to clear you know clarify that we, we're both we're we're taking we're taking it as as written but then also with those two changes that that came from tpc is that is that do you from are you clear with that laura you're muted yes i also want to add there's that other change on the last page that the roundhouse lot should be 3c and 4c um i don't know if that um made it in as well Uh, yeah it did um it says roundhouse lot remove question marks and insert 3c and 4c to reflect the visitors yeah so all of that's in there uh in our motion and um, so now, uh, would someone like to make a motion of regarding the language change for the recommendation? Uh, so, it, so would it be a, a, a but a motion to amend the uh, the proposed legislation to include the language regarding not not to exceed a one hundred percent increase? Or yeah, you want to put in a one hundred percent increase. Well, one hundred percent increase. I, I think if we just leave it without that, then it just means the mayor can't do it. So the mayor would have to come back to council for anything more than that. But we want to right. discourage. I think we would want to discourage it anyway. So, so if it reads first as like you can't do it, that if some some crazy mayor got a hair, you know, they, well, you know what I mean. Like I don't want to write into the statute. Like here's the way you do it. <laughs> Yeah, as not a, we just discourage that as a as a thing. We just don't really want to see happen. I think that that would be clear that that you know in or, you couldn't you can't do it unless you know, the council would amend this ordinance. Right, right, okay. So then, so, so then the language would be not to exceed a one hundred percent increase. And where was that exactly in section five? 
three after uh, these shall be filed, adjustments shall be made da, 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 at the end of that sentence for spaces along Main Street, not to exceed 100% uh, over the existing rate. Okay. Mara, is that clear to you? Yes, it's gonna insert it after along Main Street. Right. Great. So I have a few detailed questions. Oh, well, I guess we should vote. Let's just go ahead and vote on, on that change. Um, so any further discussion on that change? Okay, roll call on that change. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Elkins. Yes. And Councilor Moulton. Yes. So I have a few questions. Um, so see, uh, section 1C, I believe that's along the Maplewood shops. So it, is, it has it listed as 25 cents an hour uh, with no time limit. Is that, that seems low for such a, a prime location. Do I have that correct? Let me look at the map, sorry. Yeah. Um, oops. Those are the ones behind the brewery, right? The, right along the shops? There's a section right in front of the shops that um, is um, specifically regulated based on the shop, what the shop's were, interests were. So I think that's what that is. Is it the, the green strip on the map? Yeah. Yeah. So that, um, according to Nancy, I had a conversation about this with her actually this week. And she says, yep, that's the rate for the, that shop because that was part of an ordinance amendment that specifically addressed concerns for those shop owners um, in that area. Okay. Um, well, if they have a concern with it later, if they find it's completely booked up, then they can bring it back to us. Um, so 1D, which is at Forbes Library, um, there's, it says 25 cents per half hour. And under the time limit, it says 30 minutes unlimited. So that seems confusing to me. Um, Forbes Library, let me just get to that. Um, could, do you have the page in front of you where that is? I'm sorry, I can't find it for some reason. Page, yeah, page two, one D. Three D. Oh. Yeah, section one and then one yeah. D. 30 minutes underscore unlimited. Was that a Scrivener's error or? What does that mean? Well, the underscore I think is an edit. I don't know, I can't um, tell. It's, so um, I think what that means is, um, um, you know what, I as I'm looking through this, um, what I think is that you're paying in half hour increments, but you can you can pay that unlimited. They have meters there. And so Forbes is sort of this special place because I think the arrangement is that Forbes keeps the money that is collected in the meters. Mm -hmm. And so that's in their special, um, I think that's, and so it's on that one um, section of the, of the library, but there aren't any changes proposed. That shouldn't, uh, there, like there were no, I don't think there were any recommendations for Forbes at all. Well, the existing so, ordinance just says 30 minutes. So I imagine that maybe 30 minutes is supposed to be crossed out and that it was just an, an error in, in edits. Or that afterwards, um, I think actually I would um, say that that shouldn't be, it shouldn't change from existing conditions because Forbes is sort of um, not, it's still part of the system, but it's treated differently. 
because it's focused on library patrons. So I would say that that it should remain as it is in the ordinance. And it may be when we merge the tables that that's, it came over that way. Okay, so you would propose that we strike unlimited. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> why don't we, maybe there may be other changes. So in terms of, of you know, voting on, on changes, why don't we wait, oh, get through my questions and then uh -huh. we'll do them as a, as a task. Um, so 1G, I can't find that on the map. And it's not, right, it's an addition. Hmm. Um. Okay, keep going, I'll try to find that. <laughs> okay, um, section five. Uh, on page three refers to C subsection 10-4. Um, just what is that referring to? It, it, it talks about above in accordance with C section 10-4, but if we go to C, there's, and there's no uh, sec subsections of C. And four. Okay, so you're you've got that code open now, and you're looking. You can't find that. Yeah, well, in the original code, there's there's just a subsection C. Um, it doesn't have sub. It doesn't have. It doesn't have subsections or sec. You know of of any more, especially not ten. Okay. And Unless that's okay. a reference yeah. to the enforcement, uh, and I don't think. Section four. Um, okay. Um, sorry about that. I uh, just want to grab that. Um, Three twelve thirty six. Yeah, I don't, um, I guess I'd have to look into that more too. And I could, you know, um, bring that to council when you get, I mean, I, I cause I, yeah. I don't need for, to sit here and sort of um, untangle that piece. Yeah, I, I feel comfortable with, you know, addressing these, these small concerns between now and council and then. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the last is just a Scrivener's error um, in section five um, on page three. Um, adjustments shall be made based on maintaining an average 85% occupancy rate as measure over a one week period. I believe that should be measured. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that one we don't need to vote on, but the, did you, for 1D, did you, did you want to look into that or did you think we should amend at this point? The Forbes Library question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, if, if I have to look at these other ones, I may as well put that in the bucket too. Okay. Just to confirm, just to, you know, triple check, that's fine. Yeah, Laura? I think that um, C section 10-4 is a reference to the charter 
because it says there a copy of all rules and regulations adopted by a city agency should be placed on file in the office of the city clerk not later than the effective date of the rule or regulation. So could that maybe actually yeah. go with the sentence afterwards about filing it in the city clerk's office? Um, yes, there, that's there right, Laura, thank you. Nice, that's Laura. Right. Good catch. Good. Uh, <laughs> okay. And of course, so, but perhaps that should be more specific. So we don't think it's section C of this document. With the city's charter, it could say. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so does that something, Carolyn, you want, want us to make now, suggest that we make a change yeah. now? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the language would be. Um, what would you suggest, Laura? Just charter, charter section 10-4. But I, yeah. and then I think that it goes with the sentence after maybe, because maybe it, maybe shouldn't the period be after, wait, there's such a piece of the schedule. I, it almost seems to read in accordance with charter section 10-4, these should be filed with the city clerk. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. It'd be the period after above. Above in accordance with section okay above period and then in accordance with city charter section 10-4 these shall be filed with the city clerk yeah right because that or comma these shall be filed with the city clerk okay okay um i'm looking for a motion to make that change i'll move that change and i'll second it any discussion God bless you all. <laughs> <laughs> the skills you, everybody brought to bear here were incredible. All right. <laughs> all right, uh, roll call on that change, Laura. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. So those are all the questions that I had. Um, are there any other questions from counselors before we uh, vote on this positive recommendation. I have one quick question. Okay, um, Jim, yes. Carolyn, do we have a rollout date? I mean, does the mayor have, you know, an idea of when we might want to make this change? Um, no. Okay <laughs> no, we don't have a date. <laughs> Uh, no. So if we vote on this on Thursday, will it go into effect on Friday? Uh, we will program everyone's chip and yeah. it will happen the next day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, and I just realized I found the 1G reference. Oh, good. It's modifying the Forbes Library southerly portion. So it's down later on page 11. It identifies what um, class that um, parking lot is. So it may be that just the map didn't quite get updated. But if you look on page 11 under Forbes Library, it changes it from 1B to 1G. And that's because it's taking it away from being treated like the on-street parking spaces along the side streets and creating a separate section, again, sort of to recognize that Forbes Library is different from the other lots in the system. Great, thank you for finding that. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, yeah, Jim, you have another question. Yeah, I, I just want to go back to that rollout date real quick. Carolyn, if you could ask the mayor what the plan is, because I, I, I wouldn't recommend rolling this out, you know, for the holiday season, that it, it's the sort of thing you'll, you let everybody know it's coming and that maybe rolling it out in the winter months. So um, there may be some lost revenues, but I think there would be a lot less pushback, but I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there for. So you don't think Black Friday is a good day for that? No, I think that's all right. <laughs> uh, I totally agree. It's going to take some education. 
Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I right. And I think that part of it is just that we weren't sure what the process, the time process. And I wouldn't say that we're necessarily losing revenue either, right? It's just staying the same through, you know, till the beginning of winter. So um I think it's really, I mean, the really the idea isn't necessarily to adjust revenues. It's really to sort of meet the needs of the business community and trying to create the um, uh, turnover rates that are desired for those main street parking spaces. Great. So you'll check uh, with the yeah. mayor and, and we can discuss that at council. Uh, other questions? Stan. Yeah, uh, just one question about the three uh, electric vehicle charging. Um, I, EV, I know, is uh, is Crafts Avenue. EV1 is the parking garage. EV2, where there would continue to be no charge. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't I couldn't see that on the map when it was up earlier. Where Where is that, Carolyn? EV2 is... Um... Um, oh, um, I think it's, um, so it's, there's, um, there's one at the police station near the police station. There's one, um, off of Crafts Ave, right? And then, um, the third one, what was the other one that you just said? I'm sorry, well, short term. <laughs> Yeah, no, EV, EV2 is the one I didn't see on the map. EV is Crafts Avenue. Right. Uh, and EV1 is the, the parking garage. I, I, I did. Oh, right. So I, I think it's, it's at the, it's police, the police station. Police station. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not objecting to no charge there, but um, was, there, was there a reason given for maintaining one of these uh, stations with, without charging? Uh, um, without charging money for charging your vehicle. Um, I don't, so um, the intention wasn't really, let me just pull that up again about the EV charging. Um, I think this is at the fire department headquarters. Oh, that one, right. EV2, that's I a saw looking a in the text. blue behind police, okay, yeah. Um, Yes, and you know the other thing is, um, you know that of course is subject to potentially other modification. You know, as a separate um, as a separate rate structure, and I think there's more that will be coming on board, so that might be adjusted separately anyway in the future. So this won't necessarily. You know, this may not be set in stone for as long as, you know, the other spaces, because I know that's sort of a continuous conversation about the charging or not charging at those stations. Okay. So with, there are those spots at the fire department not open to the public or just for when they would be visiting the uh, fire department? Is that the thought? I don't know that they, I mean, um, but it's not in downtown, just... so there's no, they wouldn't have a charge. But they wouldn't, that, no pun intended. Um, they wouldn't have a, a charge to park there, typically, any place outside of downtown. Right. Right. But, I, and I don't know the, the answer to the question about who can use it. I think it's not really restricted. I mean, you know, even if you're not visiting the fire station, like if you wanted to go get some bagels, um, you could plug in your car. Okay. <laughs> so uh, any other questions, deliberations? Okay, let's vote on this positive recommendation. Um, Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Okay. Um, Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. That passes unanimously.
22.165 in ordinance relative to fire lanes. Um, this is continued to be tabled per request of sponsor. Is that correct? Yes. There's not yet been a new amendment um, submitted. Okay, so we will just take no action and um, the council can decide to continue to take no action as well until we have the new new um, language. Uh, so that brings us to 22.171, an ordinance establishing procedures for filling vacancies in elected positions on the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, this was referred to us on 9.15. And is there anyone here to speak to this? Let's see, Councillor Foster is no longer here. Oh. Councillor Foster is the sponsor. Um, so um, is would Alan you like... Here? Uh, yes, Alan Seawald is here. Uh, Alan, do you I think it was uh, wish developed to... by between Councillor Foster and um, and Alan Seawall? If he's still here, yeah. Solicitor, do you wish to speak to this? I, I'd be happy to speak to it. Um, when uh, uh, Councillor Foster and I were working on this, uh, we uh, Councillor Foster decided that it would be best to leave as much, much flexibility as possible for just how this is advertised and what the procedures would be. And so, um, you know, between the two of us went back and forth and this is what we've come up with. Uh, we've left a lot to the council president. You know, it's not a long, it's a, not a long drawn out process. We want to, we don't want to draw it out too long because it is a filling of a vacancy for, you know, a finite period. So uh, we wanted to give uh, the council and the president's, you know, the ability to act um, accordingly. Great, thank you. Uh, Jim. Yeah, so the council president uh, delegated this to the vice president while he was away, and you guys did a great job of pulling this together. And um, so, Alan, can you explain the? So, there's a point in 45 day, days, but there's fill a vacancy in 60 days. To me, I, I think they're both the same thing. Is there a difference, or is that just the numbers didn't need to be adjusted? Do you see what I'm, I'm trying saying? Trying to put the document up on the screen. Hang on for a second. And Laura, could you put that on the screen for me? Um, uh, getting it. Okay. Yeah, so under F, it has, uh, we shall appoint a new representative within 45 days. And then, um, and then in the last F, and then under four, no later than 60 days. Hey, uh, Laura, could you make that any larger? I can't really see Let's that. Let's try. A little more, a little larger would be helpful. I think. Sure. He's recovering. Sure. <laughs> okay, so th so the the first part of F, the forty five days, yeah, doesn't deal with elected uh, members of the committee. Okay. Because it authorizes the 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 commissions, boards, or authorities who appointed the authority to appoint the replacement, and then when you get down to um, uh, and and I I credit Laura for seeing this nuance and and correcting it for us. Uh, thank you, Laura, and um, and so I believe that that the body of F is just applies to those that are appointed for, th from other committees or through other means. Okay. So right now with this current appointment, we're, we're focused on number four here, which is Correct. The 60 days. Okay. Correct. And Alan, I see Laura nodding. Yes. So you're right. <laughs> I, that, that's how I knew I was right. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. All right, that was my one question. Any other questions while we have this up on the screen about the text? And you want to refer to any any part of it? Okay, I think we can bring that down. Um, the our, Laura uh, had a suggestion for us. Um, the language change, which was to three, to say the city council shall fill the vacancy by roll call vote, or in the case of multiple a point, a, no, a multiple applicants, it may refer the matter to a council committee for a recommendation as to the filling of the vacancy. Um, Okay, here's Laura's suggested language. Mm. Um, I just wasn't quite sure it was clear that it would come back to the full council after the referral to the council committee. I mean, maybe that's just understood, but I just thought it made it a little clearer that it would come back, the vote of, or, and it wouldn't need to go at all if there was only one applicant. I mean, that's all sort of implied anyways, but though, that just, could well, make it a little clearer if anyone. I think that's a good that clarification. Do you all motion to make that amendment? Second. Okay, made by Jim, seconded by Stan. Um, Alan, do you have any comment on that amendment? He's passed out on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> so listen there are you still with us i am okay. i'm sorry I, I i missed some of that uh that the amendment that was being proposed i did see that laura had had suggested an amendment that it not get referred if there's only one candidate and i'm just wondering whether there's ever a situation where there's only one candidate and you want to refer it. I mean, for other reasons, maybe there's more information that the, the council would like, that would like the committee uh, to do that work. So I, I wasn't really clear on that. Yeah, that, that would be my concern as well. Does it limit us um, to only being able to refer, and it sounds like it does, if, if, mm -hmm. if we had multiple applicants? What's the language say now? Shall? Is it shall? Then shall yeah. is, we must do it. Right. If, right. if we say may refer, um, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily have to. Now the current language is the city council shall fill the vacancy. Sorry, I, wait a minute, let me, The city council may vote on such vacancy, or it may refer the matter to a council committee for a recommenda recommendation as to the filling of the vacancy. So, right, is there any concern that, I think what Laura's trying to address is the concern that it perhaps doesn't say that the council will then vote on it when it comes back? Yeah, that was it. But I'm second guessing it now too, though, thinking, well, maybe it shouldn't be good to specify that it has to be a roll call vote if we're back in you know, regular session, maybe a voice vote. So um, feel free to stick with the original language. So since Laura's withdrawing her motion, <laughs> I'll withdraw my motion of her okay. motion. <laughs> And who seconded that? Yeah, I, I, I did. I'll, I'll withdraw my second. Um, you unseconded it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Never mind. Thank you for proposing it, Lori. It helped discussion. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are there other questions or? Uh, that, do we have a motion on the floor actually to, for a positive uh, recommendation? I don't think we do. I'd move a positive recommendation. 
I'll second that. Okay. Any more discussion on positive recommendation? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Great, that passes uh, unanimously. And um, I realized I promised to, to let Councillor Mayori know that this next item was coming a little ahead. So I'm just gonna let her know. You mean she hasn't been here the whole time? I, well, she's here, but oh, she's yes. here. Okay, good. But thanks. I, I did. We didn't want. I didn't want you to have to listen to all the other deliberations. Um, so we are coming now to um, twenty-two point one six eight, an ordinance amending section two seven two eighteen C exemptions. And I uh, am going to recuse myself due to a possible conflict of interest with my business, Pedal People. And um, Marissa Elkins will be taking over as chair for the remainder of the meeting. So it's been great to be with you. And I will uh, see you on Thursday. See you later, Alex. Great job. Good night, Alex. Yeah, terrific. Good night. Good night. A little jealous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so um, since Rachel, you've been, you've, you've hung in there so long, I'll let you um, speak, uh, speak to this uh, to begin. Thank you. Hi, I can't promise it will be that quiet here, but um, yeah, thanks. I, I think you, you probably are, are all pretty versed in this and um, the intention behind this amendment, but just to, just to um, bring it home, you know, it was just, it's a way of um, finally getting the, the plastics reduction ordinance rolled out um, and giving some latitude to our enforcing agent, which is going to be our, uh, the CPW director Donna Lascalia, who will be there on Thursday, but I, I just told her I would I would be here tonight. Um, so you know, as we all know, we're not quite over the pandemic, and and yet we really I, I, the will of the council and the and and the community is that we you know we keep going with our climate initiative. So this is a way of kind of addressing some of the lingering issues like supply chain issues and. Um, Business, businesses in vulnerable positions. And so it gives the director a little bit more yeah, latitude to, um, to, get, to give the businesses more time and, and, um, and flexibility. So I'm, I'm fine with it. I've talked uh, several times with the Youth Commission. We're, we're, another, we're a co-sponsor. They will also be there on Thursday. They're fine with it. And really, I think it's a, great, a good way to just to, to finally get this going. Um, and, and not have to come back to council and and uh, and change something, you know, or, or roll it back. So I think this is a great way to address what where we are now. And I'm trying to remember, um, I'm trying to remember Rachel that this was. I remember it was originally put forward as two. Am I correct about that? It was two, and now we're saying uh, a, a two month period, and now we're saying six months. Well, two, no, it was six two, month period. It was, oh, oh yes, it, it, right, two six month periods, yes. Uh, we were allowing an exemption to two periods of six month, wait. <laughs> so we're om omitting one of them. So we're saying one well, six month. We're taking out the number two. So meaning that she uh, will have the latitude to, to give it another, you know, another six month, so maybe three or four, oh, you know, that's I see. what that means. Um, I hope that's clear. I was actually really impressed. I was like only a non-counselor could come in and find like a one line and make this, you know, I would have like worked it to death and added all these words. And I it was just like, oh, this is such a like, you know, person on the, on the ground who, uh, because it was not a suggestion to just simply take out that line. And um, so that's what it does. I mean, it does give a lot of, you know, 
like it does give a lot of power to the enforcing agent. Uh, you know, in this, you know, in this situation, you know, I, I, I really have so much faith in Director Lascalia. You know, maybe down the line, if we we lost, you know, her as our director, we would want to give more structure to that. But I'm fine with it. But yes, it kind of leaves it up to her. I mean, in in uh, sorry, Stan, I'll come back to you in a second. And it is a thought, though, eventually that everybody is doing it. Nobody's going to get just indefinite six, you know, six months extensions, right? So it shouldn't be an ongoing obligation, right? It shouldn't. There's just concerns with, you know, there's just some supplies that aren't there now. So it's kind of hard to say like when that will, um, especially with Big Y, it's not actually the restaurants. It's really more like, um, Cooper's has done a great job, but like um, there's some on-premises food at the Big Y that, you know, there's, there's just not uh, compostable alternatives right now. So I guess I can't say for sure how long that would be, but no, the idea is that everyone would, you know, would, would comply, you know, as much as the market, I mean, allow, you know, as the supplies allow. I, I do think we need to like check in about it. And I, I am going to, I'm going to follow up about education, you know, support for our businesses around this, which is still a little vague, you know, support in compliance. I mean, do we want to put in a, a, like a not to exceed some pretty, I mean, relatively yeah, extensive I mean, you, period of time, but I right. worry a little bit about that this. Yeah, yeah no, you could. I guess, I guess the only reason I didn't suggest that is because I'm so, it's so unclear to me what that would be, you know, but I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, Stan, you had a question? Or comment? Uh, comment. Um, I'm comfortable with uh, the suggested uh, amendment. It removes an arbitrary limit that is still, because of the uncertainty in the economy and the supply chain, it's arbitrary. And what we're saying is that this, this uh, for a particular establishment, there will be reviews every Every six months, we're not we're not taking that part of it out, so that every six months they've got to that establishment has got to show why it's no longer it why it 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 it, it can't uh, implement the the uh, the ordinance, why it has to be exempted. So for the in the current environment, I'm comfortable with this uh, with this change. I mean, I have to say, I'm certainly comfortable with. Um... I'm certainly comfortable with extending and giving some discretion to Donna. Um, I am a little worried about it being so open-ended that both it becomes a kind of time suck for her um, if, if it turns out that there are some establishments who just aren't going to worry about coming back every six months and keep making their case and B, also put, you know, um, I mean, it just seems like it should come back to council at some point, or you know, there should be some point at which we were like, no mas, like we said, this is the rule, um, and there, and that there's some in into the the case by case business. It just strikes me as difficult to enforce, and so Jim, <laughs> yeah, um, so. I, I, yeah, as somebody who's worked with Rachel on this and also with Donna that and the in the business community, yeah, there's so I would propose the idea of having like something similar to what we did with surveillance that we embed a review, you know, that we're okay with this for right now, and that you know, in a period of time, a year, two years that you know, that we get an update and that anybody who's come back for, for multiple, um, you know, six month, um, uh, whatever it is, <laughs> I'm so tired <laughs> that, um, yeah, that, that could be a way to, um, to, to get that review in place. Yeah, and maybe it could be so rather than in terms of individual anybody looking at any individual establishments, like that seems not appropriate for council. 
Right. Uh, but also we want to take that out of Donna's hands uh, at some point. Maybe that review could be specified to be, um, you know, a report from the director um, as to as to compliance and and just overall, you know, whether or not there are any number of anybody, how many, how many places have actually asked for extensions and are still not in compliance. Right. Um, and then that way we're not addressing individual establishments, but we can take, take a look at it and be like, well, if there's one and everybody else has managed to comply. I think at that point we can be like, okay, no more, as the judges in my life say, no more continuances. Yes, Rachel. Oh, she's done. Let's see. Sorry, Rachel. Can no, we make her host? Okay. Yeah, let me do that. Game and was, uh, Sorry. So I muted myself. Um, I actually, you know, I think that's a really great idea. I love it because my concerns are really more about like, will Donna need more support? Will we need, you know, more ge like general? Um, and, you know, does she have all the tools? She, you know, I, I know this part of this, her concern is, you know, can, is, she doesn't want to roll out and we don't want to make it something that's not enforceable practically in some way. So I, I really like that idea because it will be, it will look at the entire ordinance. Um, it will give us an opportunity, hopefully in a more post pandemic world to maybe tighten up if we want, but also really to hear about how it's rolling out. Um, since there's so much, there's still some questions about what that will look like. So I'm, I have no objection to that at all. I can think, thank you, uh, Councilor Nash, for that suggestion. And yes, and uh, and then we can find out if those six month period, which, which you know, Councilor Moulton said, you know, are acting like a kind of, uh, you know, if they're doing that job of of uh, actually moving businesses along towards compliance. So yeah. So yes, Jim. Yeah. So the start date is the end of this month. Yeah, supposed to, yeah, that's what we were aiming for, yeah. So what if we put in here a review in November, you know, a, a year from now? Yeah, a year. Do you think that's enough time? Well, that would give, we by then we'd have two extensions in the books and we'd know who the, the people who are likely oh, okay. to be the three. Yeah. Um. So first of all, can I have a motion to, um, for a positive recommend or a recommendation, presumably positive? Yes, I move a positive recommendation. Second. Okay. So with that said, um, do we want to, does anybody want to offer an amendment to in, insert that language uh, for review? Perhaps the suggested, the author, the person who suggested it? <laughs> Oh, that, that's, that's right. That's you, Jim. Okay. <laughs> no, no, yeah, no, that's so, you. <laughs> so, Laura, how did we do it for um, uh, the uh, surveillance cameras? Was that like another item, you know, a, a, so a D or? I was just trying to pull that up. Um, one second. Uh, yeah. Let me see if I can get it in the code. Um, uh, it was a second uh, uh, article item review three years from the month of enactment this of this article article this article should be placed on the agenda of the city council for review that's I can screen share that if it's helpful of um, yeah so one year after enactment uh, which would be the end of this month and I think it's important for us to review it as this council. Um, and that's why I want to do it a year from now. Um, you know, future councils want to do that. You know, they can do it as well. But I, I, I think, you know, and so how's that sound? Uh, I think that sounds yeah. fine. And I think future councils, if they want to change it, should uh, write their legislation and repeal it. That's what I think. I don't think that's we should it. just like open it up to endless reviews. Um, <laughs> but 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 I think this review, especially because we're doing this extension makes a lot of sense. I will second that uh, review uh, re, uh, 
language uh, for November of uh, 2023. Subject to review. Laura, are you writing some words? Um, <laughs> well, if we follow, so you went one in one year, is that what you said? Um, it looks like to follow After the pattern. One year of it from, uh, one year from an enactment, um, the council will review this. It says this article should be placed on the agenda of the city council for re review. That's the um, review. And reporting. I would just add and a report from the, the, can we do that? Can we order that in, in the context of this kind of statute? You can report, uh, you can ask for a report from the mayor and the mayor will probably send Donna. Regarding enforcement and compliance. Yes. That's right. It should be the mayor gets to see. Madam Chair, I think that you're going to have to put in an actual date for, for review because, you know, this isn't the enactment of the ordinance. This is an amendment to the ordinance. So you can't do it from the date of enactment because this ordinance was enacted last year. Right. So we're, we're asking for review November 2023. Yeah, I think we can just, just put go. the date. Okay. Perfect. If nobody needs me, I think that I'm going to make my exit now. Thank you all. Um, you I, I think you've got this under control now. Very confident. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Good night, Thank all. You. Thank you, Alan. All right, bye. We're, we're down to the very hearty. <laughs> I'm not feeling very hearty. I, we've got to end this very soon. <laughs> well, I think we're, we... You want to read what, what you've got there, Laura? Well, in November of 2023, the council shall request a report of the mayor of... A report from the mayor. Oh. No, the, the language needs to start. The council will suggest, will request a report from the mayor in November, 2023 uh, about the... Uh, Regarding compliance. Regarding enforcement and compliance, yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Sam. No, that's, it's it, it's a great group effort. <laughs> this is how we used to write the stories at the Gazette. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. that that's what we're doing here. <laughs> I have to say, authoring by committee has never been my favorite process, but there's only one way, the only way this kind of thing happens, so. Okay, read it back a little bit. Yeah, well, in no, either this phrase in November of 2023, I had it at the beginning of the sentence, it could be after, but in uh, the council shall request a report from the mayor regarding enforcement and compliance. So in November, 2023. Okay, yeah. so it just depends on where we want that phrase. Well, we want, we want the report to come in November, 2023. We're okay, not so- We're, we're not see. requesting it in gotcha. November. Gotcha, gotcha. So that's, so it's appropriate for it to, it to come after the word mayor, I believe. So yeah, the council shall request a report from the mayor in November of 2023 regarding enforcement and compliance. How's that? Perfect. Perfect. Make a note of that, President. <laughs> so I'd like to make a, so do, do we have a motion on this? Yes. I'd like to right. make a motion that we amend it. Yes. Yes, I second it. Your yeah, oh, Councillor okay. Nash, right, so Councillor Moulton is the amendment. I'll I'll let Marissa run the meeting. <laughs> okay, so we have we have a motion and a second on the amendment. Yes. Then, if we could call the roll, please. Sure. Um, Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yeah. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Uh. Is there any further discussion on the uh, recommendation in general? Mm -mm. All right, uh, it, hearing none, if we could <sighs> get a vote on that, please. Okay, Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And um, Councillor uh, Elkins. Yes. But you actually want that sentence in the ordinance, don't you, or not? <laughs> Yeah, we want to, is, yeah. yeah, that's a mem that was an amendment okay. to- I thought so, okay, thank you. Right. 
for all of posterity, they will know that in November 2023, <laughs> we discuss compliance and enforcement of this <laughs> amendment. So uh, let's see. Uh, that's it, y'all. Can I please have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Oh, do I have to say new business out loud? Okay, do you have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Yes. I, I, yes, I second. Very good. Oh. <laughs> Councillor Elkins? Yes. Councillor Moulton? Yes. And Councillor Nash? Yes.